Now, for the first time, it's ESPN Sunday Night Baseball from Hawaii. The National League Central Division champion Cardinals with the multi-talented Brian Jordan take on the National League West champion San Diego Padres and MVP Ken Caminiti. It's the Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week. They're calling it Padres in Paradise. And indeed, for the first time, it's Major League Baseball from Hawaii. For the Padres, it's been a chance for fishing, for fun, and Hawaiian sun. But yesterday, it was time to play hardball. Game one of a doubleheader. It was Dennis Eckersley in the ninth who got MVP, Ken Caminiti, and then Greg Vaughn to preserve a 1-0 victory. Then in the ninth inning of game two, ahead 2-1, two Alan Dennis retired Vaughn for a complete game, 2-1 victory, and a Cardinals doubleheader sweep. Now tonight, the Cardinals try and make it three in a row on the Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week. Here in Honolulu, the baseball fans have come out in force. Nearly 38,000 last night and uh, nearly 40,000 expected today. The tailgaters, the kids, and even as they say in Hawaii, those baseball fans who are popule. Hello, everyone. Aloha, mahalo nui loa. I'm John Miller, along with Joe Morgan. We're getting into this Hawaiian thing. We're proposing a Sunday night baseball game of the week every Sunday out here in Honolulu. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. They ought to give it some thought. Last night, a sweep of the doubleheader by the Cardinals, despite Joe scoring only three runs, they're still in that slump they've been in all season. Well, you're right, John. The Cardinals won the Central Division last year with pitching, speed, and a little occasional power. Well, they won yesterday's ball game on speed. Brian Jordan hits the ball up the gap, and he hustles it into a double. Now he takes off a third base. He's stealing third. The throw gets away, and he comes in to score the only run. The Cardinals are going to have to score some runs. They're going to have to start hitting, or else they're still going to struggle all year long. Now, the San Diego Padres uh, have also been struggling offensively, and the Padres only scored one run in that doubleheader yesterday, and uh, their slump continues as well. Well, I think their slump is because, is because of Ken Caminetti. Look, mentally, I think he's having a problem. Physically, he's okay. He really is ahead of schedule as far as playing is concerned. But when you have an injury, sometimes it bothers you mentally more than it does physically. And I think that's the problem with him. And the reason I think that is when I talked to him, he wasn't his chipper self. Normally, he's on a high. But today, I think he's down a little bit. And when he gets himself mentally together, I think they'll start to roll. All right. It's the final game of the series coming to you from Aloha Kahua Pa'ani. Stay with us. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week is brought to you by Briggs and Stratton, your number one source of power. Make sure all your outdoor power equipment has a Briggs and Stratton engine. And by Circuit City. Hurry into Circuit City today. You can't get a better price. They guarantee it. Coming up from Hawaii, it's the Cardinals kicking on the Padres and batting champ Tony Gwynn and MVP Ken Caminiti on the Sunday Night Game of the Week. Back in Honolulu, and uh, it is not the ordinary venue. We're just uh, a little bit west, out right near P Pearl Harbor here, Aloha Stadium. Tony La Russa's St. Louis Cardinals came here all the way from Miami. They had just the one day off between a game in Miami before they opened this series last night. The Padres came here from Pittsburgh, but they had a couple of days off. Here is the Pepsi Cardinals lineup. Delano DeShields back in at second base. Dimitri Young first base. Willie McGee gets the start in right field. Brian Jordan is back in center field hitting cleanup and he has always hit well against Andy Ashby. Ron Gant in left field. Gary Gaetti third base. Tom Lampkin is the catcher. Royce Clayton is at shortstop hitting eight. And rookie Brady Raggio gets the start for St. Louis. And on the mound for the Padres is the tough right-hander Andy Ashby. Well Ashby throws hard. He has a good curveball and occasional changeup. When he throws strikes, he usually wins, so I think that'll be our quick tip-off. If he's throwing strikes, he will usually pitch a very fine ball game. And let's take a look at the defense that will perform behind Ashby in today's ball game. A couple of changes. And center field, Ricky Henderson will be playing center field. Steve Finley normally occupies that spot, but Henderson will be there today. Sion Fraco will start at shortstop in place of Gomez. So a couple of changes there for the Padres. And here is Delino DeShields as we're ready to play ball from Hawaii. The crowd still coming in. First pitch swinging strike by Delino 
the Shields. The Shields hitting 250, and right now on the Cardinals, that is one of the, the better batting averages. Cardinals as a team are hitting only 205. Right to third, Caminiti. There is one away. Yeah, you know, we talked about Caminiti and how I felt like mentally he wasn't, you know, up to par. Physically is. I mean, he made a lot of diving plays at third base. His shoulder doesn't seem to bother him after all season surgery. It's his left shoulder. He's made diving stops and throws from there, but he doesn't seem to be swinging the bat as well from the left side as he normally does. Again, I, I think when you have a problem physically, it affects you more mentally sometimes. Now here is Demetri Young. He is hitting 259 with one home run and six driven in. And uh, that's not Dimitri, and that's Royce Clayton hitting in the number two spot. So yeah. Royce Clayton hits the ground ball to second. So we had a little uh, change in the batting order there, which is kind of a surprise to us. But Royce Clayton hitting second, not eighth, has grounded out to second base. So two men are gone, and that will bring up Willie McGee. No fans in Hawaii who had always hoped for Major League Baseball here, but as an editorial said yesterday in one of the Honolulu papers, baseball coming here on a permanent basis is nothing more than a pipe dream, but at least for a one weekend, Major League Baseball has come to the Hawaiian Islands. Willie McGee is the batter now. Two down and nobody on. And a triple-A ball club here, the Hawaii Islanders have played for some 27 seasons in Honolulu, most of them in another ballpark, a very fine old ballpark called Honolulu Stadium. They moved into this park, Aloha Stadium, in 1976. Last night, they had nearly 38,000 fans, and that was the largest crowd ever to see a baseball game in Hawaii. Two down, nobody on. And it's outside. And it feels odd because usually Sunday night baseball, they play at night. But I mean, this is a two o'clock in the afternoon game, Hawaiian time. It feels odd, Joe. On the other hand, it feels just right. We're enjoying it. There's that breaking ball. And Andy Ashby shuts the Cardinals down one, two, three. Ricky Henderson, Varis, and then Tony Gwynn will be coming up when we get back. John Miller and Joe Morgan in Hawaii. No score after a happening. The Sunday night baseball game of the week. Bruce Bochy last year. He led his ball club to a divisional title in the National League West. Only to be swept in the divisional playoff by the St. Louis Cardinals. And this weekend marks their first meeting since that series. Here's the Padres Pepsi batting order. Ricky Henderson in center field. Kilvio Varis, formerly of Florida, second base. Tony Gwynn in right field. And I'd say he's been uh, somewhat hot of late. Tony hitting over 400 for the season. It'll be Ken Caminiti at third base. He's hitting only 207. Wally Joyner at first base. Greg Vaughn mired in a terrible slump, hitting 137 at left field. Archie Sinfraco at shortstop. John Flaherty, the catcher, and Andy Ashby is hitting ninth on the mound. And the pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals, rookie right-hander from San Francisco, Brady Raggio. And there you get a look at Raggio. He won his first start against the Marlins. This is his second start this year as a rookie. Ricky Henderson leads it off against him. And the count is 0 1. Ricky Henderson also not hitting, only a 160 batting average, although he still gets a lot of walks. Strike two on the outside. And when is four outfielders for three spots not too many for the Padres? Because now that Steve Finley's down, they're glad that they did not trade Ricky Henderson. One ball and two strikes to Henderson. And I've been watching Ricky a lot this season, John, and he's taken a lot more pitches than I've ever noticed. He's always walked, but he didn't take fastballs down the middle. And he's doing a lot of that lately. Foul ball. Well, Ricky, even last year, did not hit much for the Padres, but he got so many walks that hitting in the leadoff spot, his on-base average was up over 400. And, and that's good, John, to get on base, but you also have to contribute some hits every once in a while. Well, there's one. 
Let's see what he's complaining about. Right. The reason <laughs> I say that is because every once in a while you get a base hitter guy can go from first to third, or you can drive in some runs. And let's take a look at the defense for the Cardinal. You know, Brian Jordan is in center field, and they're waiting the return of Rick of Langford. He'll be back soon. And Mabry will be at first base now instead of Young. Young hurt himself, strained his hip during the warm-ups before the game. So he was a, as we say, a late scratch. Kilvio Veras shows butt and takes a wide one. One ball and no strike. So in that uh, cardinal batting order, as we saw, Royce Clayton moved up to the number two spot in the order. John Mabry in the ball game at first place in place of Young. Mabry hitting seventh, and Lampkin is moved to the number eight spot. So there. Ricky Henderson at first base. No score in the game. Varus hitting only 179 with two early home runs, and uh, the conventional wisdom around the Padres is that when he hit a couple of early homers, he kind of liked the idea. He kind of fashioned himself as a home run hitter, and they feel it kind of fouled up his swing. Well, that was kind of a pretty big swing there for second place hitter. Right there, a long swing. Down the left field line, fair ball. It's an automatic double. The ball carries well to left field here, better than it does to right field. And he hit that ball right down the line. It's 325 to the corner. And he hit the ball well. They were playing him in shallow, and the ball went over his head in left field. So the Padres are in business. Let's take a look at this pitch. Fastball away. Rajo's throwing the ball hard. That's a good fastball away. Good hit there by Varus. I mean, he stayed with it and hit it the other way. Well, they told me now, the, the word I heard on Raggio, Joe, is that he's a sinker baller. Well, that was the, the scouting report, but watching him, he's throwing the ball pretty straight. The first couple of pitches have been straight fastballs. He threw a sinker to Ricky. So now here is Tony Gwynn. He's hitting 419. Three homers, 11 driven in. Well, that gets a run home right now. The shield throws out Gwynn. Henderson scores, and Barris goes to third. It is one to nothing, San Diego. And John, he did more than just get the run home there. That is a true professional hitter right there. He made sure he pulled the ball. When you're hitting with runners at second and third, no one out, your job is still to hit the ball to the right side to move the runner from second over to third base. Now he's at third base with a chance to score on a fly ball. If you hit a ground ball, a shortstop, or a long fly ball, sometimes it doesn't help you to move up both runners. Tony Gwynn moved both runners in that instance. And especially now, I mean, Ken Caminiti could do the same thing and get another run home because Gwynn got Varus over to third base as well as getting Henderson home. The 12th RBI for Gwynn. Now, Caminiti has 12 RBIs, but only two homers and only a 207 batting average. And he's hitting below 200 to left-handed. Well, look at that. That goes back to Tony Gwynn. Yes. Get Gwynn an assist on this Caminiti RBI. Varus scores. And the Padres in the first inning of today's game have doubled their output for the entire doubleheader last night. So many hitters go up there with runners second and third, and they're trying to drive both of them in, go ahead and hit a fly ball to the outfield or whatever. Tony Gwynn did his job pulling the ball and moving the runners over, and then Caminetti does his job by driving him in. So, so far, good fundamental baseball here by the Padres in the first inning. Now Wally Joyner, two down and nobody on. Left center field, base hit. Over into the alleyway, Gant. Holding him to a single. So three hits in the inning for the slumping Padres, who were hitting only 233 as a team for the season coming into this game. Now, here's a guy that is really struggling, and he has struggled really ever since he was acquired by the Padres late last season. Well, Johnny had hit so many home runs in the American League that I think he just thought it should continue in the National League. And he saw some different types of pitches. He saw different pitchers, you know, on a daily basis. And I think he just was, you know, maybe swinging for the fences a little bit too much. And he's lost his discipline. I think he has to get his discipline back. Make sure he swings at nothing but strikes. Well, Vaughn 
Cubs hit 206 after being made a Padre last year. And look at this. It's just getting worse. Three for his last 37. But he wanted us to know, Joe, he pointed out, he said, hey, I'm I'm only hitting 100, but it's a, it's a hard 100. Well, the one thing, you know, you get when you have a slugger like Vaughn, I mean, he's a free swinger, and normally he's going to strike out a lot. You don't expect him to hit 300. But like most sluggers, they get hot, and then they get cold, and they get hot. So the Padres know that he will get hot, and when he gets hot, he can carry the ball club, you know, for a week or two at a time. Third baseman Gaetti to the second baseman DeShields, forcing Joyner. But the Padres jump out with two quick runs. It'll be Jordan, Gant, and Gaetti coming up for the Cardinals. From Honolulu, and there's some young uh, ESPN fans from Hawaii. Padres two, Cardinals nothing. We head to the second. You know, I talked about Ashby being able to throw strikes. Now, look where these strikes are, right down around the knees. And to Willie McGee, same thing. That was to Clayton. And now, if, if every pitch he threw in the first inning was below the belt. Now, as long as he stays down there and throws strikes, you will see him. He will be very successful in this ballgame. That's the tip-off with Allen Ashby. And fans at home can watch it. They start to see the ball getting up. He starts to miss with the first a couple of pitches. Then that's when he gets in trouble. But as long as he throws strikes, he usually wins this ballgame. Got that panoramic look at Aloha Stadium. Last night, uh, those outfield stands in the lower deck were just about to totally filled. But we see people still coming into the ballpark. And there tend to be uh, a lot of uh, traffic that gets tied up when a big crowd gathers here. So they, those stands may fill uh, in as we go along. Here is Brian Jordan. We missed him last week. He was out with a, a back injury. He's hitting 273. Only two RBIs for the season. That's a foul ball on the third base side. And of course, he's a guy that they look to go out and get 100 RBIs and to play a great outfield for them, steal some bases. And this is a ball club that doesn't have anybody that goes out and wins the batting title or drives in 150 runs or hits 48 homers, anything like that. But they got a, a lot of guys who do a lot of things. And they chase that bad ball, talking about keeping that one down, Joe. He, he put that one down in a lava tube. Two strikes the count. Well, the Cardinals last year, I mean, really, Brian Jordan was their MVP candidate, you know, for the league. But they, they have a lot of valuable players. They just all contribute. It's not really a one-man team or a two-man team. They have a lot of guys that contribute a lot to their success. Well, look at that. Again, keeping the ball down and strike three. Well, so far, he's been almost perfect in his, in his, in the first four hitters. I mean, these are the pitches that he threw to Jordan. See where that pitch is? Down, down further, and down and again. That's perfect. And he's throwing 90 plus miles an hour, 96 to be exact. So he's throwing real hard. And as long as he keeps it down, he's going to be successful. One out here is Ron Gant. I read an article that Duncan. The, the pitching coach Dave Duncan of the Cardinals gave a scouting report on he said in the National League to win you have to keep the ball down he said that is his keys to success for his pitching staff and it works for Alan Ashby too as you can see here now this turf is real the players described it as being very lively real springy but that dirt in front of the plate seemed to be very soft so if Ashby if they ever do hit the ball against him again, he struck each of the last two guys out. If he makes him hit it on the ground, that first bounce out of the uh, batter's box is not going to uh, get any help from the dirt there. Well, it's actually a pretty good turf, John. It's not real bad on your body. And that was one concern that the, that the Cardinals had for Brian Jordan. He has a bad back and some of the other players. Left field, base hit. Vaughn on the artificial turf. Again, it goes back to just how springy this turf is and to play it very cautiously and it's a single for Gant. Now it may be, it seems like a little thing but watch the difference in where this pitch was as compared to the other pitches we've talked about. Now if this pitch was been in the same location as the other ones meaning down then even he shattered his bat but see the ball's up so when it's up he bloops it in over the infielder's head. If that ball's down he either misses it or he hits a ground ball. 
he did a good job of shattering his bat, but the ball was up, so he muscles it into the outfield. Now, Gant at first. Here's Gary Gaetti. One homer, three battered in for the year. So he's hitting only 212. So what do you think, Joe? Now, Gant's got pretty good speed. They're down by two runs. Too risky to steal here? No, no I don't think it's risky this early in the ball game. I think if you're a Cardinal, you have to play your game. But Gant choo picks and chooses his times to steal. He's not really a, a, a stolen base type threat every time he gets on the base. He kind of chooses when he will take advantage of his speed. Cardinals as a team have been pretty selective this year. They have stolen as a team 16 bases and they've been thrown out only four times. That's the kind of numbers Tony LaRusso likes to hear. Ranked is second. Harris doubles him up. Ron Gant could not get back. And just like that, the inning is over. 2-0 for the Padres. Archie Sinfranco will be coming up when we return to Hawaii. There's the view. Neighborhood not far from Aloha Stadium, which itself is not far from Pearl Harbor. And Aloha. I'm getting into that, Joe. I should see. I'm saying Aloha to everybody who comes anywhere near me. And as the natives say here, it's just another lovely day in paradise. Everything here is beautiful. I thought it was a tourist who said that. No, no, that's the natives. They said just another lovely day in paradise, Joe. Here's Archie Sinfraco, broken bat comebacker, and Raggio throws him out. Tony Gwynn played in this ballpark 15 years ago when it was a Padres AAA affiliate. We asked him about it. The first thing you notice right away is that crown they have at center field. When I was uh, here in AAA, I was a center fielder, and so you, you play right on the point of that crown, and either, any direction you go, you're going downhill. Usually in the afternoon, the wind blows straight in from right field, so uh, it's definitely a part that favors a right-handed hitter. If you can get the ball in the air or left center or left field, the ball's going to carry. Usually, you hit it to straightaway right field, the wind's going to hold it up, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a can of corn, really, for the outfielders. John Flaherty, the hitter, one ball and no strikes, and he takes a called strike. One ball and one strike now to Flaherty. John, there's one un another unusual point here, uh, other than just the crown in center field, and that is down the left field line, as the sun goes down, the first baseman has trouble. The sun will be setting in that little area over there to where the stadium is not completely enclosed, and the sun will bother it. There on your left, right down there. The open area. Yeah. One and two to count, and the ratio misses with the slider. One ball and two, or two balls and two strikes now to Flaherty. Flaherty hitting 200, no homers, four driven in. He hit the over 300 after being acquired from Detroit last year. Toward the middle, Clayton. And there is the second out. Let's take a look at the crown that Tony Gwynn was talking about. Now, what happens, this is the center fielder, and the crown rolls off this way. They make a little better drawing. There's the center fielder. He was saying he plays right on the crown. Well, it slopes down this way or this way and the water runs off that way. That's what it is. It's very high there in center field. That's the crown he was talking about. And down the left field line is where, you know, the sun will shine over toward the first baseman's eyes late in the ball game. Here is Andy Ashby. When that slopes down like that, that's called a gradient. Well, Lynn, well Tony Gwynn called it a crown. Well, he did. Well, he but was doing the scouting report. <laughs> <laughs> so I just no, followed I'm not, him. I'm not disputing him. It's, just, oh. it's a gradient. When, oh. it, when it goes down. Oh, okay. You can measure it, see, as a gradient. Well, I think you need to tell us. In Tony. a percentage basis. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I learned that word years ago, and I finally have a chance, a chance to use, to use it. it. Yeah. Okay. A crown or a gradient. Okay, we'll save it for next time we're here. You see, he stood on the crown, but when it goes down, down on either side, big. that's the gradient. Okay. So well, that's a strikeout, but reaching on the wild pitch is Ashby. I say wild pitch. We'll see how they score it. Well, let's take a look at this. 
the catcher sitting there and it bounces on the gradient side on the you know on the gradient there and it bounces away from him <laughs> and, <laughs> and the ashby runs the first base and i i called him alan ashby earlier and that obviously alan ashby was the catcher for the houston astros former teammate of mine actually he and bruce bochy who's the manager of the padres shared the catching job when i played there it was a real compliment to alan ashby yeah. but i think a real Andy Ashby would not be too happy because no. he's about a, a foot taller than Alan yeah, right. Ashby and much more handsome. Well, I didn't say that. One ball and no strikes. I'm just reporting. Okay. <laughs> Two and zero. Oh, the count to Ricky Henderson. He singled in the first and started a two-run Padres rally. Two nothing. San Diego is leading. Brady Raggio on the mound for the Cardinals. He misses inside. Two and zero oh to Ricky. So Ashby reaches on the wild pitch. Strikeout plus the wild pitch. Ironically, that was Raggio's first strikeout of the game. And, and he didn't get the guy out. Now there's ball four to Ricky. Well, this is a Rick, typical Ricky Henderson type day when he's playing well and has a base hit and a walk. You know, he gets on base a lot, as you mentioned. See, now in this case, John, a walk is as good as a hit because he just moves the pitcher up. But sometimes if you have a base runner first who can run, then you want him to get a base hit. Get a ball in the gap, get a single, so the guy can move up more than one base. So it is important to get on base as a leadoff hitter, but you also need to get some base hits as well. Here is Kilvio Vera. He hit a double down the left field line, really fueling that two-run first inning rally. Is that big swing again, but playable in left for Gant. <laughs> well, it took off, didn't it? And wind that Tony Gwynn was talking about. Barris muscling up. 2 nothing Padres. We head to the third. Mabry coming up from Honolulu. The ESPN Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week is brought to you by Franklin the official batting glove of Major League Baseball. And by the Home Depot, where low prices are just the beginning. Welcome back to Honolulu ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Padres lead the Cardinals 2-0, and we head to the third inning. Last year, the San Diego Padres played in Monterey, Mexico. And this year, moving a series here to the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, the mastermind behind uh, these uh, various travels is Larry Lucchino, the president of the, the Padres. And Larry, uh, no, no Monterey last year and Hawaii this year. How come? Well, we, uh, we wanted to redefine the Padres market, uh, John. <laughs> and I think we succeeded in doing that. We also wanted to, uh, to reach out and, and help with the internationalization of baseball something that a lot of us have talked about for a long time but it's time to uh, expand the pie the players association has been talking about that a lot of people in baseball have been talking about it so we'd like to help go go make it happen can we be your international announcers absolutely Joe I think you guys would be perfect All ambassadors right, good. yeah I think that would be a real good idea here's John Mabry well what's next I mean Hawaii this year well, I don't know, uh, John. You know, we, we don't have any uh, present plans now, but uh, we're thinking about it. This has been a, a, a very successful uh, place to play these two games. Up the middle, base hit for Mabry against Andy Ashby. The second hit for the Cardinals. The, uh, the stadium has played pretty true to the game, and uh, we've got tremendous support. I think we're going to be close to 40,000 people here today. Now, you guys have enjoyed themselves. Bruce Bochy went out, did some deep-sea fishing, caught himself yes. a mahi-mahi. About that, they and then a luau, and yeah, and uh, you learned from the best, you and Doug Bockler and Trevor Hoffman. That's, uh, yes, that's uh, the president of the Padres there on the right. <laughs> Sometimes you have to swallow your pride for the good of the organization. <laughs> oh, you look good. Oh, thank you. He's a, a hula natural. That's a base hit. Pass in Franco for Tom Lampkin over to second and holding is Mabry. And now Raggio will come up. Two on, nobody out. Two nothing for the Padres. Well, the, if the pitch is down, as Ashby wanted, he was trying to get the double play, and he hits it in the hole. Good attempt there by Finn Franco. He just can't get over there in time, and the Cardinals have something going here in the and, third inning. And Brady Raggio will come up, most likely to drop down a bunt with the leadoff man Delano De Shields behind him. Now. Uh, Larry, you and, and the Padres are real pioneers in terms of uh, trying to, uh, I mean, not just 
internationalized baseball, globalized baseball, as it were. But I mean, taking your team out and uh, and doing that. But now also, you had the agreement with the the, the team in in Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, have been at odds over the the situation with Hideki Irabu, the, right. the pitcher. What any any news on that? Uh, well, the, uh, the runners are going. The ball is hit. They get the out there. Double play. Spectacular turn by Kilvio Veras on a hit and run play, and he still gets the double play. Sometimes you try something special and it backfires on you. The obvious play looked like there was, should have been a bunt situation and you should have had Raggio bunting, but they tried something and it looked like it was going to work right away, but a good job by Kilvera sitting here getting back to Kilvio to get there, and he makes an off-balance throw. Nice play there by at first base. Wally Joyner played the, uh, the bounce very effectively. Actually, Kilvio did not break right away. The shortstop was covering, so it's a very fine play by the second baseman. And here's Delano DeShields hitting one foul. So just like that, the Cardinals have a runner at third base, Mabry, but with two down. So, uh, again, Larry, the, the latest on uh, Irabu. Well, uh, there are still negotiations alive uh, on it, John. Uh, we'd like to get, uh, get it resolved. Uh, I think uh, everyone would like to see... Uh, Mr. Rabu playing uh, playing Major League Baseball uh, this year, but um, you know it takes uh, uh, two to tango, and we've got to get a, a good deal that, that makes sense for the for the Padres and uh, makes sense for the uh, for the other clubs who might be interested in uh, in having him uh, pitch for them this year. So the notion that he'll ever pitch for the Padres is, is yeah, I think not that, even being discussed. No, yet. I think that uh, uh, that uh, so much water has gone under the bridge that that. Uh, is unlikely. We all, we'll always have a, uh, a light on in the window should he <laughs> change his mind and want to come home to Southern California. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, he's pretty much uh, made his uh, made his preferences uh, known. I guess uh, you know it's a very unusual situation. Two down, runner at third, and it's two balls and two strikes down to De Shields. Larry Lacino president of the Padres here with us. Now we keep hearing the Yankees and, and now the Mets we hear a lot uh, in terms of the uh, teams that you're talking trade in regarding Irabu. Yeah, I spent uh, last week uh, in New York uh, on a variety of things, including some discussions uh, on that on that particular subject. But um, again, there's nothing to announce. I just hope we can get something done soon enough so uh, we can put the, uh, the issue behind us. Shallow left, base hit. Heading for second to Shields. Mabry has scored, and DeShields has a double. Two to one for the Padres. Well, the Cardinals do get a run out of it after the double play. Ashby threw a pitch. Looked like it was a sinker, maybe away from DeShields. Yes, it is. Down and away, and DeShields just hits it off the end of the bat, but he finds a area down her left field line and Vaughn does a good job of playing it as you see the ball takes that weird bounce because he had so much English on it off the end of the bat and by the time they get it back in the Shields who runs well is at second with a double yeah, uh, out here Joy it had so much Hawaiian <laughs> okay <laughs> here is Royce Clayton and he takes high for ball one what about uh, coming back to Honolulu you know, I, uh, I, uh, we were talking with some of the uh, uh, local uh, governmental leaders, including the uh, governor, Governor Ta Cayetano. He's a big supporter of baseball here, and he wanted it to be very clear that if we wanted to come back, they'd love to have us. They'd uh, love to see the Padres as Hawaii's team. Look out. Under the chin of Clayton, Chuano, now the catcher, Flaherty, will go out and uh, visit with Andy Ashby. Now. What about other teams even coming out here? Other than the Padres, you see any other ball clubs saying, hey, look at all the, the crowd, the, the big crowds they got out there. Maybe we ought to go out there next year. Well, I hope that happens. I mean, uh, we're not trying to be a one-man band here. We'd just like to, to, to uh, help the process move along. Baseball needs to internationalize. We need to work with the Players Association, uh, work with our, our players, work with different communities, and make it happen. It's got to be a grand collaboration. If we can get more clubs that are interested in doing it, that would be great. I mean, it seems to be tremendous interest in baseball out here. Oh, yes, no question. A great uh, tradition here. And I think the 37,000-plus we had last night was about the fourth or fifth largest crowd in baseball last night. 
and we're going to have about 40,000 today. It's going to be a long throw by Sinfaco. Just in time to get Clayton. Larry Lacchino, president of the Padres, many thanks. Aloha, John. Let's see you, Joe. Mahalo. Two to one, the Padres over the Cardinals. We'll be back, Bob. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball from Honolulu. We're at Aloha Stadium, not far from Pearl Harbor. And that's a look from the stadium over at the Arizona Memorial. Of course, uh, December the 7th, 1941. A day that will live in infamy. That's what President Roosevelt said. And uh, memorial over there. The Arizona still submerged after being sunk, uh, causing the, the loss of uh, so many men and visited by thousands and thousands of people every year. Here we go now, back to action in the last of the third inning. Tony Gwynn, Ken Caminetti, and uh, Wally Joyner coming up against Brady Raggio. Gwynn got a lot of things done. He drove in the first run and set up the second, just with a little ground ball to second base. And it's all about knowing what you're doing when you go up there. And no one knows better about what to do in the batter's box than Tony Gwynn. And he's healthy this year after having a bad Achilles tendon in his last year. He had an operation. Now he's healthy again. And he said he hit from a better platform. His front foot is more stable. It was twisting out last year, which sometimes would cause his shoulder to open up a little too quickly. And there you see his numbers. It's the first guy to hit over 350 for four straight years since Medwick did it. Ducky Medwick, the last Triple Crown winner in the National League back in the 30s. And DeShields throws out Gwynn, and there is one man gone. Two to one, San Diego leading last of the third. So far in this ball game, he's rolled his right hand, his hand over a little bit, and I think that's why he's hit those two ground balls. The first time he was trying to, that one was just a ground ball up the middle. And I noticed something with Caminetti in batting practice in yesterday's ball game, hitting from the left side. He sometimes takes his left hand off his bat after he extends through the pitch, which tells me that, you know, maybe his shoulder still bothers him a little bit at certain times. And truthfully, that's how you develop bad habits. He was, he's always been one to keep both his hands on the bat. He punished the lefties last year. Well, he wasn't supposed to be back. I kept hearing he might not be back until the All-Star break. Well, I thought it was, you know, the, the last report I heard he would be out the first month of the season, but of course he worked real hard and rehabbing himself, and he's back way ahead of schedule. But again, sometimes that, you know, you know that you're not completely 100% and it bothers you more mentally than it does physically. He knows that he's healthy enough to play. He's just not getting the job done right now. And there, see his hand come off the bat. He didn't turn all the way through the pitch as he did last year a lot of times. Well, that's one of the things they're worried about. I mean, he is so tough. I mean, he is the ultimate in terms of uh, mind over matter. Watch his back shoulder, and watch when he gets to a certain point, he just lets the bat go. And if you can remember his swing last year, he kind of swung all the way through. That was a much better swing right there. He swung all the way through the pitch on that two-and-one swing. Two balls, two strikes now to Caminetti. They were a little concerned that maybe he was rushing things and might set himself back by coming out too soon, but he kept insisting that he was fine, and here he is. Into left field, the base hit. A line shot on one hop to Gant. Good swing right there, and the last two were very were, were much better than the first one. He stayed right in there and lined that ball to left field. Now watch this pitch. See, he keeps both hands on the bat all the way through the swing. That's kind of good. Now watch the difference here in the one we first one we saw. See right there? He swings through the pitch. So Caminetti is aboard. And now Wally Joyner is the Mea Healy Kini Popo. You didn't think I knew that, did you? No. <laughs> You're su you surprise me more every day. You know, that's uh, Hawaiian for batter. Oh, okay. Mea Healy Kini Popo. You know, the man who really was the father of baseball in the United States, Alexander Cartwright actually came here to Hawaii back in 1849 and brought baseball here. So there's a, a very long and rich tradition of baseball in the Hawaiian Islands. When he came here in 1849, it was the kingdom of Hawaii. 
buried somewhere around here nearby right down the street well not far from the old uh, yeah. ballpark honolulu stadium yeah, i told you i knew that too <laughs> base hit for joiner caminetti is going to test the arm of the right fielder and he makes it mcgee's throw offline good heads up base running there by caminetti he had his mind made up right away and mcgee does not throw really well anyway but Jorner reaches out and pulls this ball in the hole and watch Caminetti sees it goes in the hole takes a quick look to see where McGee is now he just makes up his mind comes on around actually McGee had a shot at him throw a little bit offline and Caminetti's in the third easily and there so far the Padres have played very good sound fundamental baseball so there are some right fielders he would not have tried that with but the word must be Take the extra base against McGee. Now here is Greg Vaughn, first and third, one out. This is the spot where Vaughn has been struggling so terribly. He has three homers this year and three battered in. He has not driven in anybody except on solo home runs. Well, the first at bat, I thought he had a good at bat. He kept his front shoulder in, everything stayed in, and he hit, a, hit the ball hard to third base. First pitch here, his front shoulder flies out. He looks like he's trying to hit a three-run home run. His front shoulder's moving just a little too soon, and but that's you know that's the timing mechanism that that a slugger needs. Caminetti is the Cucchini at third. Join us at Cucchini at first. Oh, look at that! The throw down to third, almost safely back is Caminetti. Lampkin gunning the ball down there after Vaughn goes down on strikes. Well, the first two pitches, his shoulder kind of pulled out, but he was able to get a piece of them because they were fastballs. Now watch, this is a breaking ball down and away, and watch, it. right there he's okay, but then all of a sudden his front shoulder will fly out even more. Now watch, as, as he swings. See, look at that. His front shoulder just flies out, no control, and that's what we were talking about earlier. Needs to have a, just a little bit more discipline because he's you know, free swingers are like that. Those sluggers, normally they're going to go through spells where they're not keeping their front shoulder in and they will strike out a lot. Then they'll go other times where they're swinging the bat well and they'll keep their front shoulder in. What they're doing here is deciding what they're going to do if there is a double steal. You know, if Jarna takes off from first base, they're deciding whether they're going to throw through or try to get Caminetti at third base. That's what the meeting at the mound was about. Coming up now on Wednesday night. Wednesday night baseball back in the mainland. From Camden Yards, Albert Bell, Frank Thomas of the White Sox, taking on Cal Ripken and the Orioles. The Orioles are hot. The White Sox are really struggling. Then, the second half of the doubleheader, this uh, worldwide journey of the Cardinals continues from Dodgers Stadium. The Cardinals and the Dodgers at 10.30 Eastern on e ESPN. One strike to count to Sinfraco. Now, this is where the Padres and Cardinals these kinds of situations where they have really been hurting all year long. It hurt the Padres, especially last night in the ninth inning of the second game, down by a run. They had Gwyn at third, one out, and they couldn't get him home to stay alive in that ball game. Well, I think the thing that bothers you the most is uh, they played a fundamentally sound inning here. Runners at first and third, and then Vaughn could not put the ball in play. There are times when a slugger has to forget that he's a slugger and make sure he puts the ball in play. And I'm not being critical of Vaughn, I'm just saying that there are times over the course of the season when you just have to put the ball in play. And right now he's struggling, so everything goes against him. But, you know, again, that's the, what happens, and pretty soon he'll be swinging the bat well, and he'll be hitting home runs, and everybody will be happy. Two balls, two strikes now to Sinfraco. He hit a comeback at Araggio his first time. It's a big spot for Raggio. He had runners at first and third, only one out. The slugger Vaughn up. And the Padres had a chance here to extend their lead in the third inning. Now Raggio is one strike away from getting out of it. Unscored upon. Caminetti at third base. Joyner at first. Too low. And now Joyner goes in the delay. And they have stolen a run. Scoring is Caminetti. Joyner is tagged out. Actually went out of the baseline. Called out for that. But the Padres have stolen a run. Caminetti steals home. Three to one Padres as we head to the fourth. McGee, Jordan, and Gant coming up. 
from Hawaii, Padres three, Cardinals one. They stole a run there in the third, did the Padres. Well, I think it's a mistake. Watch Lampkin. Let's see if he looks Caminetti back at third base. He does not. See, that's the problem right there. You have to look the runner back at third before you throw to second base. And they caught him off guard because it was a delayed steal. So the shield should have been in front of the bag to kick the ball, but because of delay, no one was there in time. Very smart play there by the Padres in using the delay rather than a straight double. Now what happens there is even though Caminetti stole home, they call it a fielder's choice because they retired uh, Joyner. So, so no, no steal no of home. No steal of base. It's a fielder's choice. So he, he stole the run but doesn't get credit for exactly. a stolen base. And I think he should, though, personally, but that's... That's me talking. I think that's, that's one of those right. bad scoring rules. What do you know? Well, what do you know about baseball, exactly. Joe? Exactly. And what they, do you know about stealing? <laughs> if they could have gotten Caminetti, they would have, right? They couldn't get him. I mean, if ever a team stole a run, that was it. That's exactly right. Because if they could get the lead runner going home, that's who they would have taken. But again, the Lampkin did not look him back at third base, as you could see there. A good shot of that we had on our camera we had. You have to look the runner back at third. Willie McGee retired. Now here is Brian Jordan, who struck out his first time, hitting cleanup. It is three to one for the Padres. Andy Ashby on the mound for San Diego. Ashby, who, when he's been healthy, has been very reliable for San Diego. But last year, for instance, he was on, uh, or he was hurt three different times. Take a look again. Now watch Lampkin. He never looked at Caminetti at third. Now watch Caminetti. He starts as soon as he raises up. Here comes Caminetti. And because the shield was so deep at second base, he couldn't come in front and cut it off. So it was really a poor defensive play there by the Cardinals, but a smart play by the Padres. They put the pressure on. One ball, one strike to count to Jordan. So Lampkin, who's been around a while, has made a mistake. Three to one to score. Not only, not only that, John, but with two strikes on the hitter and two outs, why would you throw through anyway like that? You know what they're trying to do. Maybe you throw the ball back to the pitcher and then, you know, or something. But I would never, with two strikes on the hitter, you have to be, you can't let him steal a run. And that's the kind of thing usually you're supposed to remind yourself of ahead of time. Well, we saw them. They went to the mound and discussed what they were going to do. And I guess the, the idea was to throw through, but you still have to look back. But again, I think the delay is what threw the playoff for the Cardinals, I believe. Three and two now to Jordan. Here's Tony La Russa. He's executed some plays like that in his favor. Right. On occasion. Here's Carney Lansford, now a, car a coach with the Cardinals. The third. This is going to be a long throw for Caminetti. He's going to use the turf. Two men gone. Good play there by Caminetti to use the turf. I think Davey Concepcion, the first guy I saw, really start to use that play because most of the time, the infielders on the left side have good arms and they usually want to show them off and Caminetti has one of the best arms in baseball but you can see here he clearly throws that in to get a one hopper to Joyner. By the way we have a change in the official scoring now they're going to uh, credit Caminetti with a steal of home. Well I, I, I like that idea but from a technical standpoint if you retire someone it's really a fielder's choice. Well I like though the idea Joe that they clear it with you before they right no I agree he deserves the stolen base because he, you're right he, he stole, stole the run he yeah. stole the run yeah. Gant the hitter wow Gant was halfway back to the dugout as that one snapped over the inside one ball one strike good breaking ball here we talked about how good a curveball Ashby has and you see great rotation there real tight rotation that breaks straight down and Gant has already turned away it reminds me of, you know, growing up in San Francisco, I used to see sad Sam Jones. He'd make guys fall down and the ball break over the plate. Two balls and a strike to Ron Gant. He singled his first time. Two down, nobody on. <laughs> <laughs> Three and one. And now Flaherty goes out to talk to Ashby. Well, we mentioned that Ashby has been so dependable. In the last three seasons, Greg Maddox, uh, uh, Greg Maddox of the Braves has the best ER. And then there's Ashby, just ahead of Ismael Valdez, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz. He's the 
only non Dodger non Brave who made the list and one thing that they all have in common is they try to keep the ball down except John Smoltz he can overpower you but all the other pitchers in that rotation use sinkers and sliders and off speed pitches even Smoltz seems like he's more effective when he's you're right keeping the ball down that is the strike of the outside three and two the count they had three infielders to the left of second now you see the second baseman Kilvio Barris moving back to the right side a little bit well, I think that was the play with Gant's head a little bit. When he's ahead in the count and you're going to have to throw a fastball, he think he might try to pull it so you move over. Now with two strikes, he might go the other way so you move back. That one is belted deep into left center field. Henderson can't get it, and he crashes into the wall. Gant to second. Heading for third. He's going to be waved home. Here comes the relay. Please, an inside the park, an inside the park home run. Henderson still down out there. He hit that wall very hard. Well, he hit it in an awkward position. I think he, he didn't realize it was coming up as quickly as it was because then he could have turned his shoulder into it, but he was in an awkward position, still chasing it. He reached out to get it. The ball bounced away from him. And you have to give Gant credit. He was running all the way. He was hustling. Now, here's Henderson going after it. See, he stumbles right there. And that's why he went in almost face first into the wall. Watch him stumble. Right there, he loses his footing, and he misses the ball, and he crashes into the wall. Now, Gant was running hard all the way. Good job by a third base coach waving him home, and he slides across the plate with an inside-the-park home run. But you have to give him credit. He was running from the time he hit the ball. That's what allowed him to be waved home. And we'll have to see about Ricky. Actually, stretching looks like his leg he's stretching right leg Renee Latchman the third base coach for the uh, Padres uh, team doctors to see if he can help out with Ricky Ricky is up on his feet now Steve Finley is ordinarily the center fielder Ricky Anderson has throughout his career has been primarily a left fielder but he's uh, been filling in with the injury to Finley and they're a little short-handed should Ricky not be able to continue well, and then maybe they, they had four outfielders. Someone said they had too many. Maybe now they don't have enough. Because they're, they're down to three with Finley being out. But I'm, it looks like Ricky's going to stay in the ball game. And maybe he hurt his leg when he tripped rather than when he hit the wall because he lost his footing when he stumbled. And that may be what caused him to strain his leg a little bit. And then he hit the wall. I first thought he was going to get over there in time, but the ball really carries well that way. Now watch right there. See him stumble? His right leg seemed like it did buckle, and then he hits the wall. And I think he has to be thankful that he's not hurt a little bit more severely than it appears to be, because he could have hit his head against the wall or upper body, and he could have really hurt himself. And an appreciative ovation for Ricky Henderson. And he stays in. Inside the park home run, the Cardinals first inside the park home run since 1986. And that one was hit by Andy Van Slyke in Montreal. Well, this is a big ballpark in center field. And when the ball hit Karen Ford center field, obviously Greg Vaughn had a long way to go to get there. Tony Gwynn had a long way to come from right field. So by the time they got the ball back in, Ron Gant had scored. So Ron Gant with the inside the Parker, the first major league home run ever hit in Hawaii is an inside the park home run. There have been other homers hit here by major leaguers over the years, but not in major league games. Babe Ruth played here, as did Lou Gehrig and well, several the, other great names. Well, if the Babe played here, I know he hits some home runs. He here. hits up. Back to the mound, Gaetti. Victimized by the quick reactions of Ashby. But the Cardinals get a run on the inside the park home run. Sinfraco coming up three to two. Padres. Sunday night baseball from Honolulu. Padres three. And the Cardinals two as we go to the last of the fourth inning. Now tomorrow at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. 
2.30 Hawaiian. It's the Anderson Consulting World Championship of Golf, U.S. Championships. The field including Phil Mickelson, Tom Lehman, and Mark O'Meara will be competing in single elimination match play competition. That's the Anderson Consulting World Championship of Golf tomorrow at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. Here we go now. Archie Sinfraco takes a called strike. Three to two. The Padres are leading. Last of the fourth. Brady Raggio on the mound for the Cardinals, the rookie. And that is a called strike. Or as they say in Hawaii, Raggio is the Maya Noel. Pitcher. Oh, okay. The Maya Noel. Facing the Maya Hili Kinipopo. Sinfraco. Sinfraco sounded like a guy who would understand that, didn't he? <laughs> Three to two, San Diego. A little more action uh, in today's ball game than the fans got here last night. There were four runs scored in the entire doubleheader last night by the two teams combined. But the fans seemed to enjoy. There were a real lively crowd here last night and sort of a festive frame of mind. Aloha, ESPN. Go Mariners. So, uh, the Mariners, certainly they have some fans out here. I know the the Dodgers have many fans out here. The San Francisco Giants have a lot of fans here. And both the Dodgers and Giants have uh, several of their games broadcast out here during the season. That's foul down the right field line. Still three balls and two strikes. Everyone's Sports in Paradise Network. Aloha, ESPN. They said there are some 1,500 Padres fans came out with the team. A travel agent in San Diego. Many had never been to Hawaii before, which is hard to believe. Oh, God. Over to first goes San Franco. Now for an update, here's Gary Miller. Hi, John. What has started on April Fool's Day finally ended. The Cubs won a game. Todd Huntley needed 12 pitches. Turk Wendell finally got him out. Cubs trying to nurse a 4-1 to lead in the ninth when Lance Johnson hits a two-run double. And they thought it would blow up in their face again in the ninth, but Jim Riggleman finally tasted victory. Wendell got Manny Alexander to ground out to Hernandez. One and 14. The Cubs are on their way, and the beers are no longer 45 cents at Harry Carey's. All right, Gary. So the Cubs have indeed, at long last, won a game. The second longest losing streak to start a season in Major League history. Baltimore, of course, still has the record with 21 consecutive losses back in 1988. And both of those streaks, Joe, seem impossible, incomprehensible. Well, 21 definitely seems impossible because they had some good players on that team. So the Cubs have won, and uh, as Bruce Bochy, the Padres manager, pointed out before the game here, he said, you know, last year the Padres, in a year they won a division title, had a stretch where they went 4-23. and 23. Popped up by Flaherty, Mabry, and that's the first down. Sinfraco hit by a pitch over at first base. And now Ashby, the pitcher, will come up. Three to two, San Diego is leading in the last of the fourth. The Joe Beck in the World War II. There's Bruce Bochy, who, of course, used to coach for Jim Riggleman, the Cubs manager, when Riggleman managed the Padres. And he's, he said he was pleased that they finally ended that losing streak for, for Riggleman's sake. Here's Ashby. He struck out but reached first on a wild pitch. He swung and missed at a pitch in the dirt. Going back to the bag of Sinfraco. In World War II, of course, uh, many Major League players went into the service. And uh, many were stationed here in, in Hawaii, in Honolulu. Ashby showing bunt. Back to the bag is Sinfraco. And at Hickam Field, not far from here, Brigadier General William Flood thought his 7th Army, uh, Army Air Force team was doing so poorly, so he pulled rank and uh, rounded up some of the top players. He brought in Joe DiMaggio, uh, Mike McCormick of the Cincinnati Reds, Ferris Fain. That's a foul ball. Owen won the count. And before a crowd of 30,000 people, with all of those great stars, Joe DiMaggio hit a 435-foot home run. Well... Admiral Bull Halsey got a little upset, so he also pulled rank. 
And for his uh, sub base team out here, he brought in Pee Wee Reese, Phil Rizzuto, Virgil Trucks, Dom DiMaggio, and Johnny Vandermeer. The only man ever to pitch back to back no hitters. <laughs> they had some pretty serious ball going on down out here back in 1944. Stan Musial also played here in 1945. And then over the years, the various other major league teams actually came through here. 1953, the New York Giants came in. In 1955, the Yankees came to town with Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, Don Larson. And then the Brooklyn Dodgers, including Jackie Robinson. Actually, after finishing his final season in the big leagues, he came here with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Ashby down on strikes, bunting and missing. They've had uh, seen a lot of ball here over the years. Babe Ruth came out in uh, 1933 and played both here in Honolulu and also in Hilo. Came back with a team that was managed by Connie Mack in 1934 with Lou Gehrig and Jimmy Fox. And they didn't fly out here on any 747s either. How did they get here on the boat? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Maybe the babe, maybe the babe just flew. <laughs> Ricky Henderson, the hitter. And the uh, old uh, Matson liners. They may, they may have come out on the, maybe the Monterey or the Lurleen or, or whatever. 2-0 to Ricky Henderson, still in the ball game after crashing into the wall on the inside the park homer by Gant. Watch it, he stumbles, watch his right leg, and this is what he apparently injured right there see he stumbles and then he goes face first almost into that wall that's why I say he's lucky he wasn't injured more than he was but it seemed to be just a problem with his right leg and he seems to be okay so Padres are reading the sigh of relief that's a foul ball two and one to Ricky Henderson here he's been aboard twice with a single and a walk and even though he started today's game hitting below 200 he was hitting 160 at game time I mean, he's, his on base average is well past 450. Well, Davey Lope and I were teammates of Ricky Henderson's in 1984. And we talked today before the ball game. Davey Lope feels like Ricky's taking too many pitches, as he does right there, a fastball right down the middle. And that's, he thinks that's one of his problems. Base hit. Heading for third, Sinfraco. Ricky Henderson reaches for the third consecutive time. He had had only four hits all year until today. Now he's two for two with a walk. Uh, it's difficult to take a lot of pitches and be behind the count 0-2. Oh, it's actually a pretty good pitch, but Ricky Henderson fights it off. It's a fastball in. He fights it off to right field. And watch. Good pitch, actually. He just fights it off. And he gets enough of it and finds a hole on the right side. And Frock goes off with the crack of the bat, and he goes around to third base. So... And truthfully, Ricky Henderson used to take a lot of inside pitches to right field when he was hitting well. Well, the batter is Barris. Now, Ricky's got to go. What do you think? Now, he might be hurting, though. Yeah, you don't know exactly how he feels, but Ricky is not the, you know, stolen base threat that he was, obviously, a few years ago. A little more age on those legs, and he kind of picks his spots a little more carefully now than he did before. Gilbio Barris is... There goes Ricky. Lampkin's throw. Safe! Holding at third, Sinfraco. I think the Padres felt like they would not throw through there, and they didn't have Sinfraco come down the line. Although Royce Clayton was in better position, Royce got there in plenty of time that if, if Sinfraco would have taken off for the plate, he could have come up and taken a throw. Now watch the position. He just still doesn't look, but watch the position of Clayton. See, he's in a position where he could come forward, take the throw, and throw home if Sinfraco would have run from there on that play. Two and one to Varys. Harris doubled into the left field corner in the first and then flied out deep into the left field corner in the second. Now a base hit can open up this game a little bit. It is three to two San Diego. Two men in scoring position. Base hit. Sin Franco scores. So does Henderson. Five to two San Diego.
Silvio is doing a great job today. I mean, that's hit one to left field, and now he hits this one to right field for a base hit. And he drives in two runs. Fastball up above the belt, and he lines it to right field just past Mabry there at first base. He just pitches up a little bit, and he hits a bullet in the right field, and Ricky Henderson with his speed is able to score from second. Now, Varus is the guy who can steal a base. Rajo throws it over there. Varus led the National League in stolen bases as a rookie with the Marlins the year before last. And he has three steals so far this year. He gets a long lead over there, the front foot out on the turf. Tony Gwynn, 0 for 2. Well, they thought he was going. One ball and no straight. They got to pitch out again after you do that on the first pitch? No, I think that was a smart play, though, to pitch out because maybe you can get Varus thinking that you might pitch out, but I don't think you pitch out anymore. And if, and if you watch Raggio, he has a pretty high leg kick, and he does give the guy time to run. He'll be trying to bury his motion here, but I don't think he pitched out anymore. Ball one strike now to Tony Gwynn. Gwynn, although 0 for 2 in the game, has an RBI. And part of the credit for that, because Henderson and Varus have been making things happen, hitting in front of him. He has an RBI and an assist. We'll give him an assist. He had a hand in each of their first two runs by simply hitting a ground ball to the right side of the infield. Had a run home and then set up the next run, which Caminetti brought in with a ground ball to the right side. He had two in the first, one in the third, and now two more here in the fourth. Cardinals with single runs in the third and fourth. Five to two for the Padres. And Ferris is back. Mabry on the bag with him over there. Davey Lopes is the first base coach for the Padres, keeping an eye on things. Here's Davey. And he'd like to manage in the big leagues, but no jobs out there for him. There goes Barrett. Lampkin's throw. Save another steal. And the slide is the reason that he's able to beat this throw because he goes in head first and he's able to extend his arm out and he just barely gets in there before the tag is applied by Delano De Shields. If he would have gone with his feet first, I think he may have been out on this play. Good job there by Varus. Now watch. It's going to be a close play, but watch how he extends out. The, the throw is on the shortstop side, but you'll see he extends out as the Tony Gwynn gets a little... little fly ball, ball, and that falls for a base hit. The left fielder, Gant, went for the catch as Jordan laid back on this turn, but it still falls in, and scoring is Varus. And that makes it 6-2. to two. Just a bloop by Tony Gwynn in his second RBI of the game. Well, you see Ron Gant saying, I didn't know if you could get it. I had to give it a shot, and he did. We'll take a look at this pitch. Fastball actually is right down the middle. Tony's upset because he didn't do more with the pitch, but you see Gant can't quite get there. And as you mentioned, one outfielder always has to back up the other one. And Brian Jordan was backing up Gant there, and the ball fell in front of him for a base hit. Cardinals bullpen is busy as Tony LaRusa goes to the mound. There's John Frascatori, the right-hander warming up. Three runs have scored here in the fourth inning. Of course, remember we had a doubleheader here last night. Although LaRusso's bullpen came out relatively unscathed. I mean, all things considered, Alan Bennis pitched a complete game victory in the second game. And in the first game, their starting pitcher, Matt Morris, got a hurt, hit by a line drive on his pitching hand, hit by Tony Gwynn, and Mark Petkaisic came on and pitched six innings out of the bullpen. But that alone also helped keep them rested. But I think LaRusso would rather not have to pitch another five or six innings out of the bullpen here today. Caminetti the hitter with Gwynn at first. Caminetti one for two, a single and a run battered in. And that's called a strike. I wonder, Joe, obviously if he's hurt, he's hurt. If, he's, if his swing's not quite right because of that, well, that's a different story. But today, for the first time, the master plan of Ricky Henderson and Silvio Varis in the lineup at the top of the order making things happen is happening really for the first time this season. I mean, they have not been getting on base much both in uh, terrible slumps. That's got to make things a little easier on a guy like Caminetti who's expected to carry a big load in this club. Well, that's true. And in fact, I, I read a comment that Tony Gwynn made, and he said Ricky Henderson has to play. 
He said, Kelvy Overis is a good player, but Ricky Henderson is a better leadoff hitter. And he said, on this ball club, we need Ricky Henderson to play. There goes Quinn. What a jump. They won't even throw. Raggio paid absolutely no attention to him. That's the third consecutive steal in this inning. Henderson stole, then Varus stole, and now Gwen has stolen second. Well, you watch, he has a high leg kick. I mean, Tony gets a great jump. I mean, he's <laughs> running long before Rajo throws to the plate. I mean, that may be the, one of the best jumps I've ever seen. I mean, the pitcher was still holding the ball, and he just took off. Usually, as a base dealer, you react to his first move. But, I mean, let's take a look at this. I mean, now watch. One, two, three, four steps before Raggio delivers to the plate. Well, Raggio is like the Lampkin earlier. I mean, he never even looked over there. That's off the foot of Caminetti. Foul ball. Three balls, two strikes, the count to Caminetti. Win in scoring position. Let's take a look at this swing from Caminetti. A pretty good swing, but he doesn't like the result. It hurts. It does hurt. In fact, Danny Carter will foul the ball off his foot, fractured his knee out for a few months. It's Matt Williams that did something like that. Yeah. Went with the Giants and hit the foul ball off his back foot. And uh, ended up on the DL for a long time. Foul ball down the right field line. Look at all that foul territory. 77 feet between first base and the grandstand, and the same on the third base side, between third base and the grandstand. So there's a, a huge area of foul territory. Last night in the doubleheader, there were five pop-ups in foul ground that were caught that might have gone back into the stands in most other ballparks. That is fair. And another run will score. Gwynn is in, and Caminetti looks like he got hurt. Looked like he might have pulled a muscle. He started uh, limping just before he got to second base. Well, it looked like his right hamstring gave out on him on his way to the bag, or maybe it's just a cramp. That's what he's hoping, it's just a cramp. It's pretty hot out here, and you can lose a lot of body fluid, so it could be just a cramp instead of a strain. And I'm sure the Padres are hoping that it's a cramp, and he's grabbing it like it is a cramp, like maybe other knot in there. And we'll take a look at it as he's running here. Right there, you see him kind of come up. And, you know, truthfully, that does look like it could be a cramp, maybe more than a hamstring pull. Hmm, he may have been out there. He may have been out. It looked like he reached back with his foot, but he didn't grab the foot. And you see they're trying to stretch it. I think that that may be more of a cramp, but you're, you're not sure. Well, it certainly would be ironic if that's what it is, because it was Caminetti in Mexico last year who was suffering uh, from the effects of perhaps drinking some bad water and was all dehydrated. They had him on a, an IV before a game. They thought he was going to miss. Of course, he played at a couple of Snickers bars, hit two home runs that day. Well, hopefully he's going to be all right. Pitching change being engineered here. Seven and two Padres will be back. Two Padres last to the fourth. Ken Caminetti has uh, left the ball game, but he is walking around under his own power. Chris Gomez. A shortstop has gone in to replace him as a runner at second base. And John Frascatore has come on as part of a double switch for Tony La Russa's Cardinals. Frascatore will come on into the number six spot of the order as we see his numbers. And they also have a new third baseman in. There's David Bell. Now third hitting in the ninth spot, which is the third spot due up for them in the next inning. So Brady Raggio unable to make it through this fourth inning. Four runs have scored, including four consecutive two-out hits. Now, Wally Joyner, who is two for two. Gomez in second. In the dirt, ball one. Two down, and Franco aboard. Henderson singled. Barris, two-run single, and so on and so forth. There you see Caminetti as he pulls up halfway between second, first and second. And in watching him go off, you know, I think it's a little bit more than a cramp. Let's just hope it's not a severe hamstring pull. Now, watch. Let's take a look here. You see he grabs his leg. Now, watch. He reaches back with his foot, but he misses the bag, and then he touches it. <laughs> Maybe 
the umpire just felt it just just not right to call him out after he gets hurt like that. A great warrior like Caminetti who plays through so much pain. It's one of those unwritten rules, Joe. <laughs> She went over to Wally Joyner. It's funny, I mean, Clayton didn't really get into any kind of a big argument over it or anything. First base, Mabry, and just like that, the inning is over. But Henderson, Varis, Gwynn, and Caminetti with consecutive hits. Four runs in, seven to two, Padres. In Honolulu, Sunday night baseball, Padres seven, Cardinals two as we head to the fifth inning. Harrison, Matt, Mason, McCovey. Now, Morgan and Miller. Yeah, we autographed that for him, too, Joe. Look at that. We, that yeah, he's from St. Louis. Oh, is that where he we was? We should have paid his way out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every team should play in paradise. And, John, speaking of paradise, while we have a moment, I want to say hello to Bonnie Dewey in Kentucky. Says it's cold back there, and she wishes she was here in Hawaii with us. Well, unfortunately, can't make it. Everybody doesn't get these kind of gigs, right? Yeah, and I think it's better if everybody doesn't get these gigs. I think just <laughs> you and I should get them. John Mabry, the hitter, against Andy Ashby. So here are the Cardinals, down by five, in the midst of a team slump. San Franco has moved from shortstop over to third base now, and Chris Gomez has taken over at short. Too late on that fastball. Mabry starting the year in a slump as well, although he singled today and scored a run. There's Gomez moved over to short. 7-2 to two for the San Diego Padres. You know, it's funny. It's hitters change each year, John. We, we think of hitters, you know, being consistent or whatever, but they change each year. And you may not be able to find the exact slot you were in the year before. Or you may move your foot back six inches and it changes your trajectory. You may hold your hands in a different position. And, and in watching Mabry, just the first couple of swings here, he has a bigger swing than he had last year. He looked like he was more of a line drive hitter last year. And now he's taking a big swing, like right there. Uh, and it could be because, you know, one of the criticisms of Mabry has been that he doesn't hit a lot of home runs, he doesn't drive in a lot of runs. So maybe he's trying to prove that he can do that. Right through the middle. Look out, Andy. Base hit. That's what we expect from Mabry. Exactly. Short, your short swing, which we won't get a chance to see, but that was a short line drive swing. Say, fans, uh, you'll have more baseball telecasts at home than ever before when you purchase Major League Baseball extra innings with hundreds of games from outside your area. Call DirecTV or Prime Star to subscribe to Major League Baseball extra innings. Hey, man, I have that. I watch all the games. I do. You are just... Yeah, I watch all the games. You are just pupule over baseball, aren't you? <laughs> Here is Lampkin, the catcher. And kind of beleaguered today, man. They've been running wild on him. Four steals against Lampkin. I say on him, I mean him and the pitch, him and the pitcher. Yeah. Right. Two way street. Lampkin singled his first time. All base fields will tell you they steal off the pitcher, which we know Tony Gwynn stole off the pitcher because he had a running start. <laughs> now see, Gwynn should not have been given credit for a steal. <laughs> Give. Caminetti the steal of home earlier, but don't give don't Gwyn. Give Gwyn one. Yeah. To be cheated. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He left the base too soon. Too soon. <laughs> but in Little League, you can't leave until the ball leaves the pitcher's hand. That's right. Yeah. But uh, actually, in Major League Baseball, you can leave whenever you want. Yeah. Usually, it's not it's not advisable to leave when the pitcher's just standing there holding the ball like that. I had a lot of good jumps in my career. I never had one that good. <laughs> He redefined the term, yeah. good jump. Oh, that was, that was a tough, tough pitch. Great well, breaking we, ball. We've seen him throw, like, three great curveballs. He threw one to McGee to strike him out. He threw one to Ron Gant to make him turn his back on it. And now this one to Lampkin. Now, look at that rotation. Down. Just great rotation there. Down and away. And Lampkin becomes an out. There you see what he's done. When he, when he keeps the ball down, he does well, but he's gotten a few pitches up in this ball game. Up to Gant two times, actually. And Gant to the, uh, the deep drive to left center, just over the glove of Henderson from inside the park home run. But there have been no putouts by the Padres outfield. No fly ball outs against Ashby today. 
But as I said at the beginning of the telecast, if he throws strikes, he's going to be in good shape. And if you look, he has not walked a hitter. And when he throws strikes, he wins. I mean, that's basically, he has such good stuff that when he throws strikes, he's going to win. David Bell, the hitter. And uh, the count goes to 2-0. and oh. David Bell was in there for the injured De Shields last Sunday when we were in St. Louis and had two hits, drove in a run. He was swinging the bat really well that last week. Those are still his only two hits of the year. He is two for 19. Andy Ashby with a 2-0 and count. And there is ball three. Ashby leading 7-2. We asked him about his uh, improved performance these last three seasons, and uh, we're going to let you hear his response to that here momentarily. Three balls, no strikes, the count to David Bell. The last week we mentioned he was Buddy Bell's son. And it's the walk for David Bell. So Andy Ashby pitching so well when he's been healthy recently, and we asked him why. I learned how to watch the game and learn, you know, and uh, I talk to Tewsbury when this here. I was in his ear every day trying to learn and, you know, watching Maddox pitch and um, Fernando being here. I mean, it's, I think the big thing for me is going the other way. You know, I used to, when I came up, I was, oh, I'm gonna wanna throw this ball by a guy. You know, now it's, you know, I know how to change speeds and throw uh, off speed, off speed pitches uh, behind him and when I'm behind the count. So I think the main thing, I've learned to pitch instead of just being a thrower. Well, a familiar tale oft told by many pitchers. Well, and that's true, John, but I think sometimes if you have a good arm, and Ashby does, you have a good breaking ball, hard breaking ball like you have, I don't think you should fall in love with change-ups or any other pitches. I think you should use your best stuff and get some hitters out. Delano DeShields drove in a run with a blue double along the left field line his last time. He's one for two. He's got two men on here with one out. In the air. Well, this should be the first put out. Padres outfield, Ricky Henderson. And even that one, that started to carry, being pushed by the winds as Ricky went to get it. Well, he definitely wasn't sure of that one. <laughs> he didn't, you know, he kind of, he came in and then he went back. But that wind you see there is blowing towards right field right now, not towards left field. But a lot of times in these types of stadiums, it'll come in and hit the wall and bounce back and push it out the other way. So you can't tell all the time by which way the wind is blowing, by the way the flags are blowing. I mean, just the way the outfielders have been reacting on right. balls to left, center, and left, it seems like the ball is being pushed. Yeah. And some kind of way it is recirculating through the stadium well, and pushing toward left field. Maybe, Joe, they have an old uh, expression here in Hawaii for things like that. Maybe it's the menehune. Yeah, I, I do know that. Yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> the menehune, sir. There's ball one to Royce Clayton. Two men on, two men out. Now, there's a lot of time left in this ball game. We're only in the fifth inning. Two men on with Mabry at second and Bell over at first base. In other words, there's time enough for the Cardinals to cut into this lead, but they need to take advantage of opportunities like this. Maury Wills used to always say, hey, you don't have to get them all back at once. Get a couple here, one there. You got ample time to cut into that lead. And Ashby, for the first time in this game, Joe, looks a little uh, yeah, unsure out there. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I'd expect Maury Wills to say something like that because he couldn't get you but one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> but he could do a great job at that. That's Bruce Bochy. You know, the players say they love playing for Bruce John because he doesn't have an ego. You know, usually when you're in a power position, your, your ego is there. Bruce doesn't have an ego, and anytime he has a problem with a player, he will yell and scream like all the other managers, but once it's over, it's over. He doesn't hold, hold it against you. He doesn't walk around mad at you for three or four days. He gets it off in his chest, and all the players say they love playing for him. And he was a teammate of mine, and that's the way he was as a player. I mean, if he had a bad game, he'd be upset, but he didn't carry it over. And he never let his ego get in the way, and I think that's the key to his success so far. And he knows the game very well. Well, coming up next Sunday night, we will be in another warm place, Florida. Mike Piazza and the Los Angeles Dodgers taking on Jim Leland's Florida Marlins with Gary Sheffield, Bobby Bonilla, 8 o'clock Eastern next Sunday night. Now, Clayton chased a high, hard one there. Hey, John, you forgot Moises Alou. Moises Alou, Bobby Bonilla, yeah. Gary Sheffield, the Marlins 
struggling though to get swept this weekend by the surprising San Francisco Giants at uh, Candlestick Park over the weekend lost today two nothing the Giants the the Marlins are also slumping early on this year that's a base hit Mabry is going to be held and a pretty good throw by Tony Gwynn throws pretty well for an old guy yes he does another quirk with this stadium is that because the center field is so deep the outfielders left fielder and right fielder they play shallow they kind of bunch so that they're in shallow and it's very difficult to score on a single hit this hard like Clayton rips this ball Tony Gwynn has won a gold glove in his career has won four to be exact and he's very accurate as a thrower he doesn't have a great arm but he's always been accurate and he charged the ball got rid of it like a gold glover should and and they hold the runner at third no, maybe he would have been out by about 15 feet or so <laughs> bases loaded and here is Willie McGee so this is a big moment for the Cardinals just to try and cut into this lead with a great opportunity McGee 0 for 2 against Ashby 1 1 and truthfully if you're Tony La Russa, this is the guy you want up at this point right now because there's not a real pattern you can take with Willie McGee I mean he may hit a ball six inches off the ground for a base hit he may hit one over his head for a base hit he may pop the one up down the middle but he is a good hitter, and there you see what he's done against Ashby. Been a good hitter against Ashby. Padres bullpen gets busy. Base is loaded. Two down. And it is 0-2. The base runners, Mabry, who singled at third base. Bell, who walked at second base. And Clayton, who singled, is at first base. All ready to go in anything with two down in the fifth inning. 7-2. to two. The Padres are leading. But the Cardinals, with that great opportunity to cut significantly into that lead, this would be a spot where ordinarily Tony La Russa would have one of his very best hitters, Ray Langford, hitting. But Langford probably won't be available, at least for an, another few days. Although La Russa says Langford is lobbying to play as early as Tuesday when they get to Los Angeles. Two strikes to McGee. Good fit. That's what you want to do to McGee. You want to try to get him to chase pitches because, as I said, he's a free swinger and he will swing at pitches out of the strike zone. But he didn't bite on that one. Sean Bergman, the right-hander, warming up in the Padres' bullpen. Three men on, two men down. Andy Ashby under duress here in Hawaii. Strike three call on the inside. So McGee leaves them loaded. It'll be Greg Vaughn coming up when we get back. McGee didn't think so. 7-2, Padres over the cards. Sunday night baseball from Hawaii. Sterling hey. Hitchcock went out surfing here on the day off on Thursday. But that's not him. Can you do that? Yeah. Oh. Why not? Oh, okay. And yes, the weather is... Outstanding. Mid 80s. Nice trade wind blowing. Yeah. John Miller and Joe Morgan in paradise with Sunday night baseball. Greg Vaughn pops it up third base side. The catcher doesn't see it. And nobody's going to be able to get to it. The catcher, Lamkin, did not know where it was. And uh, Bell was just too far away to get over there, I guess. And uh, finally, when Lamkin picked it up, he could not get there either. A lot of times when it's this bright and the ball goes up, you don't see it right away. Remember now, you got a bar and stuff in front of your face. You don't know where that ball is. So he's looking straight up and it's off to his left. He can't find it and it's not his fault he can't find the ball. Because, and then he, when he dials find it, it's just a little bit too late. Vaughn is appreciative. Vaughn with another light. That skimmed off the bat into the catcher's glove, strike three. A foul tip strikeout. And that's just the way Vaughn season is going right now. You're right. Well, he was appreciative for one pitch anyway. We want one more chance, and he got it, but good pitch there. By Prascatori. When you're ahead 0-2 in the count, you want to come in on some of the sluggers. That ball's up and in. He tried to get out of the way, but foul tip, and it's strike three. And you see Vaughn doesn't argue here. See, it's right there, just barely skims the bat. And he is now three for his last 40. That's a slump. That's three, a slump. Three for 40. But I, I'm going to be honest with you, I can identify with him because I, I never went three for 40. I went 0 for 35. 
<laughs> you would have had to get a heart to make it up to <laughs> three to forty. Sin Fraco has hit a comebacker and been hit by a pitch. Oh, for thirty-five. When was that? Um, Eighty-four with the eighty-three with the Phillies. But I tell you what, you know how I came out of this one? No. Hit a home run off Nolan Ryan. He he lost the game, one to nothing. Only run he gave up. Well, the I only remember. time in his life he ever hung me a curveball. I remember that. I year. think he felt sorry for me. You had the bad year. You got a manager fired. <laughs> Pat Corrales. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. The, the Wheeze kids. That was, I it, was part of that group. I wasn't one of the Wheeze guys, but I was on oh, the yeah. team. You were one of the young yeah, guys. Yeah, I was one of the young guys. Well, you were on that team. Yeah, you're right. Pete yeah. Rose, Tony Perez. What were you, 38? Yeah, 30, yeah. somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> But you made it to the World Series. You're right, against the Orioles. Two and two the count. To Sinfraco. Three and two now. Seven and two the Padres lead in the last of the fifth inning. I'm uh, serious now, Joe, as we see Tony La Russa. His ball club swept a doubleheader last night, making today's ball game a little less urgent than it might have been otherwise for the Cardinals. Oh. Have been off to a real slow start. Look out. And Sinfranco got a walk there. Hey, they might just go ahead and ask one of those other umpires if he swung on that check swing now. <laughs> Don't be tossing that bat around, Arky. Wally Bell didn't appreciate it. <laughs> so maybe that, that song, hey, ain't that a kick in the head? <laughs> well, let's take a look at it. He just kind of... You know what it is? He was trying to Enzo, throw it away, Enzo. but he's got so much pine power on his glove, John, that it's kind of stuck. Watch, he's trying to throw it over there, but it won't come out. <laughs> and uh, thank goodness Tom Lampton saw it. He was able to fend it off. Yeah, Arky, next time just drop it right down in the ground. John Flaherty. Grounded a short and popped up the first. Seven to two. The Padres are leading in the last of the fifth inning. And that's will come back out of play off to the right. But I'm thinking, Joe, you know, Larry Latino, the president of the Padres, was here with us, trying to expand the Padres' horizons and, and Major League Baseball's Baseball, horizons right. in general. Let's have a game every, or a, a, a series every, every weekend out here, and we'll just have Sunday Night Baseball permanently anchored out here. The teams will come to us. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're seeing you're seeing the logic to that, aren't you? Well, this is a fun place to to visit, and it says keep coming back. I guess okay. they're talking to us, or are they talking to the Padres? Well, if the Padres are coming, we're coming. We're coming. All right. Two strikes to count to Clarity. Carry always said the runner goes and Franco the ball is fouled by Flaherty. A little hit and run action there. Count 0 and 2. Can't beat fun at the old ballpark. You're right. Look at all these different hats. None of these guys play on the same team. There you go. ESPN is on a roll. <laughs> I think they're that's a surfer too, man. Well, we could get a little more serious with our surfing if we came out here on a regular basis. And right now, you and I are just uh, sort of novice surfers. <laughs> Two strikes to count to Flaherty. But the uh, true story, uh, Sterling Hitchcock of the Padres had always wanted to try surfing. He heard Hawaii was the place, so on Thursday, he went out and did a little surfing. I think Ricky tried it as well. That guy's in from uh, New York, I think. <laughs> always a guy at Shea Stadium dressed in a hat like that, isn't he? Is that a hat? Well, you got it. When you come out here into this harsh sun, you got to stay uh, out of the sun. It's always advisable to wear a hat. One ball and two strikes. Yeah, I noticed you were trying to take Larry Lucchino's hat. Now, there's a, there, now that's one. That's a native type hat right there. Astro, there's. I'm sure that Astro's one today. Makes, makes Mark. Happy. Mark Payton, our director from Houston, very biased towards the Astros. There's a Cub fan. They're having them everywhere. Today. They finally won today. The Cub fans uh, everywhere, it seems like. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little hot. 
<laughs> well, at least we at least we know he had water in that cup. <laughs> I don't know. I'm yeah, no, you don't waste anything else. I'm still not sure. <laughs> it's a, an Aloha cap. One ball and two strikes to Flaherty. Seven and two, the Padres are leading. Mabry on the back at first with Sin Fraco. One out. Padres batting here in the fifth. Time taken. And there on the left is uh, enjoying himself today with a day off is Mel Proctor, the television voice of the San Diego Padres, who used to broadcast Hawaii Islanders games out here in this ballpark, in fact. Center field. Jordan. And Flaherty, after a long battle with Frascatore, is retired. You know who else used to work here was the vicious thing, Harry Callis. Harry Callis worked in Honolulu back in the 1960s. You're right. Before he moved to the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Andy Ashby now. 7-2 for the Padres in the last of the fifth. Al Michaels worked here. Hank Greenwald. To work out here. There's nobody at second base. <laughs> which was quite a surprise to David Bell. And he wanted to throw to second. And there was nobody anywhere near the bag. So he does throw to first to get Ashby. We go to the sixth inning. Jordan and then Gant coming up. Studio Home Depot brings you this week's rising stars. It's Jason Dixon of the Angels. He's 3-0 now with a 2.45 ERA. 21 strikeouts in three games. Just ask Biff Roberts of the Royals. And I'm annihilated them 11-1. Mitch Roy Williams made his Royals debut. Four runs, two innings. Okay. Padres 7, Cardinals 2. Sunday night baseball. Actually in the afternoon here in Honolulu from... Aloha Stadium. Well, let's take a look at that last play, John. And now watch, you'll see where it looks. There's the shields way out here, and he's moving toward first base. So he's not going to second base, you know, so the third baseman can take the short throw. Now, see the third baseman, Bell, looks up, no the shield, so he has to throw to first base. And that's okay, except that's a lack of communication. Before the play, before the pitch, you're supposed to tell him meaning the second baseman was supposed to tell everybody on the left side I can't get there because I'm way over here. So the guy knows right away, but you're supposed to let him know. Yeah, it was obvious that Bell did not know. No. Andy Ashby into the sixth inning. Threw a kind of a high breaking ball there to Jordan, but he merely fouled it back to the screen. It is 0-1. Jordan has struck out and grounded out. Jordan uh, hampered with a bad back. Kept him out of action for a week or so. He's not hit with any kind of power at all. Hit a double last night. He only got two extra base hits for the season. No homers as yet, and only the two RBIs. Seven two for the Padres, up and in. Now, the pitcher, Frascatori, is due up third in the inning. So the Cardinals have some bullpen activity going as they come to bat here in the sixth. Popped up. A lot of room in foul ground here. But it doesn't matter. Neither Joyner nor Flaherty could get to it. Rich Batchelor, the right-hander warming up in the Cardinals bullpen. Well, Joe, you and I are living right because not only did we get to come to Honolulu this week, I mean, it's still real cold in a lot of cities in baseball. Right. Next week, we go to Miami. Yeah. We'll see the Florida Marlins under their new manager, Jim Leland, with all of those uh, new players. We say salute, Bobby Bonilla. Now in that ball club, along with uh, Gary Sheffield. Yeah. Jordan hit by the pitch. And uh, I'm sure Jordan doesn't feel that he was throwing at him because, I mean, he's struggling here. And he was ahead in the count, one and two, and he was trying to come in off the plate. And this pitch gets away, and Jordan really turns late. But he gets a piece. I mean, in fact, you were talking about the, the Marlins. I mean, they had a kind of a beanball war there with the Cardinals last week. In fact, Jim Leland and uh, and uh, Tony La Russa got in a shouting match, and they're best buddies. And they were upset at each other because of what was going on on the field. 
Gary Sheffield get hit by a pitch. Ron Gadd has singled it homeward and inside the park. Home run back in the fourth inning, the second of his career. He also hit one six years ago when he was with Atlanta. And you know where he hit it? In St. Louis against the Cardinals. I guess he owed him one. <laughs> one ball to no strikes to Gant. Mark Sweeney has come out of the on deck circle to hit for the pitcher next. But uh, Gary Sheffield got hit by a pitch on a 3 and 0 pitch. And that's what made Leland upset because he said it was obvious to him that they were pitching around Sheffield. The way uh, Leland described it was they showed him uh, fork balls in the dirt until 3 and 0. And then all of a sudden a fastball ends. And he said, hey, if you're pitching around a guy, what? Right. Why would you just throw another one in the dirt? Why would you throw it in on him like that? That's too low, and it is two balls and no strikes. Well, we mentioned Gantz inside the park homer. It came back in the fourth inning. Well, that's a fastball out over the plate. Now, Ricky Henderson chases it. He stumbles, and the ball bounces away from him, so he can't chase it. And here you see the end of the play as Grant Gantz caught across his home plate with a home run. Uh, that's got to be the, the most exciting play that you can see. An inside the park home run. And, and you, you see, don't see him often. And you can see Ashby is really struggling here to throw strikes. And like I said, this is when he gets in trouble. When he's, he's just, he, got, he has good stuff, but he just gets behind. And then the hitters know what's coming. They can sit on the fastball. Now he's behind 3-0 and oh after hitting Jordan with a 1-2 and two pitch. Padres bullpen is busy again as well. 3-0 the count. And that's ball four. So a hit batsman and then a walk. Not what they want to see with a five-run lead. And Bruce Bochy pacing around in the dugout. There is Sean Bergman, the right-hander, warming up in his bullpen. The Padres do not have a left-hander in their bullpen. Batting for the pitcher, Frascatori. Dan Warthen will go to the mound. And we're going to get a pinch hitter here. Mark Sweeney will come up to bat for Frascatori. And Warthen to the mound. And they will conference out there. Say, friends, tomorrow at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, 1.30 here in Hawaii. It's on ESPN2, the Philadelphia Flyers and the Pittsburgh Penguins in Game 3 of their Stanley Cup playoff series. Eric Lindros and the Flyers lead that series two games to none. Remember, Mario Lemieux, the great Mario Lemieux, will retire at the end of this year. So time is running out for the great Lemieux and his team need to win down two games to none in that series. The Flyers and Penguins. That's tomorrow night at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN2. Mark Sweeney, left-handed hitter, four for 22 at the start of the year, but two for four as a pinch hitter. Two men on, Jordan at second, Gant at first. Nobody out. What he really needs to do is concentrate on getting a sinker down, make sure he stays down with a couple of pitches, try to get a ground ball. Right there, good pitch. Sweeney may have been lucky he didn't hit that one. That might have been the double play that Ashby would like to get here. Well, what you have to do from a catcher's perspective is make sure, you know, you kind of force him down, 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 make sure he stays down with these next few pitches. One strike to count. Broken back ground ball to third. They get one. Veras to first. Not in time. Jordan moves to third base. Gant out at second. Sweeney safe at first. Now, this was a slowly hit ball. It was, you know, he broke his bat, actually. He hit it to third base. And Jim Franco, Franco throws to second. Now, watch. I think the second base, I, I believe in coming across. That gets the ball to you quicker. If you stay there, you're, you're waiting for the runner to get you, and you can't get as much on the throw. If you come across the bag, come toward third base, you get the ball a little quicker, and you get rid of it quicker. The sooner you get it, the sooner you can get rid of it. And that's a play right there that I think can be made sometimes if you come across. Here's John Mabry. He is two for two. And that's out of play, off to the left. Looked like a pitch to hit right there. Yeah, but that was definitely a pretty good pitch. It was a little bit up and right in the middle of the plate. 
Mabry hitting only 174 coming into the game, but he is two for two in this one. Cardinals trying to get their guys out of slumps here. And also trying to get healthy. Wow. Ball and two. Cardinals left the bases loaded in the fifth inning. Willie McGee was called out on strikes. The bases loaded to win the inning. So the Cardinals, most of the time, have not been able to score more than two runs. Now, Mabry chasing that high one, and he's gone on three pitches. Well, it wasn't just a high one, but he tuned it up a little bit on that one. That was 95 miles an hour up in the strike zone with two strikes. That is what you call going after the hitter right here. Now, this is, I mean, that's just, let's see if you can handle this high heat, and he cannot handle it. You see he was late. You have to wait and make sure it's not a breaking ball, and by the time you realize it's not, you're a little late. That ball's right by Mabry. Good pitch there from Ashley. I mean, he reached back and got it there. Now Lampkin was single and struck out. That one's in the center field. Henderson back. That's just not the place they headed in this ballpark. 420 to straightaway center. And the ball seems to get knocked down by the wind here. Still 7-2 for the Padres. Henderson will be coming up. John Miller with Joe Morgan. Sunday night baseball for the first time from the Hawaiian Islands. And there's another look at the USS Arizona Memorial over in Pearl Harbor, which is not too far from Aloha Stadium. And there is Rich Batchelor on to take over the mound for the Cardinals here in the sixth inning. Top of the order coming up for the Padres, Henderson, Veras, and Gwynn. Now, other changes. Uh, Sweeney stays in the ball game to play center field. The, the new catcher is Mike DeFelice. And uh, let's see, Sweeney's in right field. McGee moves to center field. And uh, Jordan is out of the game. So DeFelice will hit in uh, Jordan's spot. There's Sweeney in right field. McGee moving to center. So LaRusso making a few uh, switches here to try and get a little more out of his bullpen after the doubleheader here last night. Ricky Henderson, two singles and a walk. Scored two runs, stolen a base. Vintage Ricky Henderson. This is what Ricky Henderson what made him the best leadoff man of the game for so many years. Maybe the history of the game. Seven to two, San Diego is leading, and the, the top of the order has done the damage for the Padres. Henderson and Varence have been on five times between them and scored four runs. And Ricky just keeps on going. Ricky Henderson, so often the subject of trade rumors. Tony Gwynn, though, talked about Henderson on this ball club. With him in the lineup, I honestly think we're a better ball club, you know, and it's unfortunate we're all outfielders, but uh, uh, we're a better club with him in the lineup, and so there's going to be situations where Boach wants to get him in the lineup, and one of us is going to have to take a day. Sooner or later, you know, there's going to be that point where Ricky wants to play, and he's going to let people know he wants to play. And myself, the way he's handled himself this spring and throughout this whole ordeal, you know, when Boach comes to me and say, hey, I want to give you a day, to put Ricky in there, that there's nothing I can say. That's very good. I mean, that's a that's a high compliment to Ricky because a lot of times people have questioned Ricky's attitude, you know, but he's saying he's really handled it well. And uh, Tony also prefaced that with me by saying they may not want me to say this, but I really believe we're a better team with Ricky in there. And that's really maybe take, taking a slap at some situations because they, you know, gave Greg Vaughn a new long-term contract and they're not sure when Ricky Henderson is going to be able to, you know, get in there on a daily basis, but Gwen definitely believes they're a better team with him there. And a lot of people do. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to a couple of general managers who feel like the Padres are a better-looking ball club with Ricky in that lineup. The only problem is with Ricky in there and the team as it was before Vaughn got there, they're short on power. Vaughn, even though he did not hit for average when he got there last year, in 143 at-bats hit 10 home runs, right. which is 
what they got him to do and hit 41 all told last year. And no matter what you say, over the course of 162 games, you're going to be behind. And the way to get when you make up ground when you're behind is by hitting home runs. Two balls and a, uh, a strike to Varus here. Two balls and two strikes to Varus, I beg your pardon. You see Ricky Henderson and Kilvio Varus, five for six with a walk. They've been on base between them six times, four runs scored. Varus also with two RBIs, and each of them has stolen a base. And then Tony Gwynn and Caminetti coming up after them. And they have certainly benefited. Both Gwynn and Caminetti have picked up two RBIs, two each. Gwynn awaiting his turn over on deck. Henderson at first. Ricky is right. Felicia's throw is not nearly in time. The 1,189th career stolen base for the leading stolen base artist in the Major League Baseball history. From playing with hit Ricky and watching him play, I knew he was going this time. He took, he walked off and he took a more confident lead that time than he did before. And I, I just knew he was going. Actually, he almost got a great jump. He almost left before the pitcher threw it, but Ricky steals another one. And by the way, we were told uh, DeFelice was catching, but uh, double-checking, that is Danny Schaefer doing the catching. So, uh, and beg your pardon, and Barris goes down on strikes. Pretty big swing for a little guy on two strikes. Well, he takes a big swing, but, uh, you know, he's, he's hit some line drives today, so we can't, you know, you can't be critical of him, but, you know, uh, this is a big swing right there. I mean, his head and everything else goes, but... You know, he's young, and he's still trying to find his niche up here. This guy here has a control swing. Well, this guy, as they say in Hawaii, Joe, Tony Gwynn is Nunui. Which is Hawaiian for great. And it's interesting, you know, Tony Gwynn is different than any other hitter in the game. And he has more than one swing, more than one approach. You know, you try to groove a swing, as all hitters do, but Tony has a couple of different swings, depending on where the ball is. And he is one of the few left-hand hitters I've ever seen that's actually a better high ball hitter than low ball hitter. Deep into left field, Gant. He's got it. Henderson back to second, just back in time. Back into the shadows went Gant. Beautifully done. Well, uh, that's one of the things that Tony Gwynn talked about because his foot is better now and he can get a better foundation. He can drive the ball better to left field. And he really hit this ball well. If he just didn't hit it high enough to get it over the head. This is more of a line drive. See, there's that swing that he just throws the bat at the ball on the pitch away. And he hit it hard, but a nice running catch there by Ron Gant. And Tony Gwynn will have a different kind of a swing on a pitch that's up in the strike zone. He's just, he's just a great hitter. Now here is Chris Gomez hitting in Caminetti's spot in the order. Caminetti, uh, we have not received word on his uh, status. Of course, we're not in an actual big league ballpark, so getting word here is not the same as the system that uh, is used in big league ballparks, but we'll still try and uh, find out what the word is on Caminetti, and we'll pass it along to you if we're able to. And Gomez takes a ball. One ball and no strikes. Henderson at second, two down here in the second inning. And now we do have information. Our Peter Pascarelli figured it out, Joe. And uh, it was a, a strain of his right hamstring suffered by Caminetti. Well, Not good news for the Padres. Well, it, it, it's good news if it's just a strain, <laughs> if it's not a pull. You know, you have to consider yourself lucky if it's just a strain. And, you know, a strain, you can maybe be out a day or two, and that's it. But if it's a pull, I mean, you can be out for quite a while. Steve Finley, Bruce Bochy said he's going to be out at least another couple of weeks yet with uh, an elbow problem. They're going to do more tests when they get back to the mainland. It's a called strike. Finley thinks he hurt the elbow making a throw during the spring. But... Uh, it just doesn't seem to get better. And uh, the only thing that he's been able to do for it is not throw. Total rest. He's able to hit. He takes batting practice every day. They use him as a pinch hitter if the 
situation arises where they can do it. But he just can't throw the ball. There's Henderson, who's been playing every day in the absence of Fenwick. He's at second. Two down. And a foul ball down the left field line. One ball and two strikes. Yeah, here's a Aloha Stadium joint. Get some fried noodles. Yeah. Sushi. Manapua. You ever had Manapua? No, I can mm. go for sushi and the noodles. Yeah. Well, that, or Simon. Oh, yeah, I oh, like that. that. Is, that's very good. And fish and chips and corn dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Slider misses from Bachelor. Two balls, two strikes. Or oh, you can get the Calby plate, Joe. I know what the baby back ribs are. I don't know what the Calby plate is, though. I think we ought to try it. I know it, what a though. hamburger is. <laughs> I, think, I think we should try it. How about some lemon, a lemon chicken sandwich? That sounds pretty good. Seven to two Padres, last of the sixth. Runner at second. The foul tip held by Schaefer, the catcher. Gomez down on strikes. We head to the seventh inning. Bell, the Shields, and Clayton do up. Seven to two Padres. Hey, baseball. Aloha. Mahalo Nui Loa. From Honolulu, the Padres seven, the Cardinals two. And coming up tomorrow, 7.30 Eastern, Baseball 97 with Roy Firestone. And up close, special. 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ESPN. We see a lot of the fans that came out here with the signs today. There's some Cardinal fans. I know that one guy is because it says, from St. Louis. That's always a pretty good <laughs> indication. <laughs> Well, let's take a look at a swing that has hit 300 or better for 14 straight years. This is Tony Gwynn. Let's take a look. Now, right here, though, he has pretty good balance, as you can see. But a lot of times, Tony Gwynn doesn't have balance because he hits with his upper part of his body. He doesn't really drive with his leg. You can see he's on his toe. He's not really using his legs to drive through the ball. Ball is popped up by David Bell. A lot of foul territory here, and Sinfraco uses it. Although that one, I think they would have been able to catch it almost anywhere. Well, he's gone. Now, Tony I want to Gwynn out in right field. I want to make another point about Tony. There you see his career average. But Tony Gwynn uses a 32 and a half inch, 30 ounce bat. Now, I mean, that's almost little league size. The average big leaguer uses 34 and a half inch, 32 or 33 ounces. Some of the big guys use bigger bats, but that's the smallest bat, you know, that anyone uses, which is amazing. But he felt he went to a 33-inch bat a couple of years ago, and he said he, he hit more home runs, but he didn't feel like he could handle the inside pitch with the longer bats. So longer at 33 inches. And the only guy I ever saw use a small bat like that was Bake McBride, who played for the Phillies and for the Cardinals. He used a 29-inch bat. You know, it's a little heavier than, than Tony, but a 32 and a half inch 30 ounce bat. That's amazing. Going on now to Delano DeShield, who's grinded out, blooped the double to drive home a run, and flied out to left center. One for three. Royce Clayton on deck. We're in the seventh inning. Andy Ashby and the Padres ahead seven to two. And, uh, you know, a couple of innings ago, I wouldn't have given much for the chances of Ashby still being around by now. He got through the base loaded situation in the fifth. He had a hit batsman and a walk to start the sixth, but he got through that as well. He's still around. And that's out number two. The Shields is out on strike. Six strikeouts now for Ashby. Well, what happens, John, sometimes a pitcher will lose his rhythm. And I think that's what happened to him. And then he got in trouble and he said, hey, I've got to find it. And he found his rhythm and he gets back on track. And this is that fastball he just throws right by. The Shields, and I think the reason that he, he found his rhythm, he went to a few more fastballs. He stopped trying to spot it. He just became an overpowering pitcher. And as I said earlier in the ballgame, sometimes you get a little too cute trying to spot the ball. But if you've got good stuff like he has, you can just turn it loose. Cute can be good, but yeah. too cute, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. You're right. right. I mean, especially if you throw 94 miles an hour. Yeah. You don't. You don't need to be. You don't need to be that cute. Don't be too cute. Be macho. <laughs> Let me give me another statistic on Tony Gwynn because it's amazing to me. I said he's hit 300 or better 14 straight years. Rod Carew hit 15 straight years. Ted Williams 15. Stan Musial 16. Honus Wagner 17. 
and Ty Cobb, 23 straight years, he hit 300 or better. I don't think Tony will last for eight more years hitting 300, but he, he might. You never know. And there you see he's second in the National League to Honus Wagner and third all-time major leagues with Ty Cobb leading. But only Honus Wagner has more than he has in the National League. He's tied with Stan Musial, of course, for the National League lead. And of course, both uh, Honus Wagner and Ty Cobb played toward the early days of this century. Wagner even uh, started before Cobb. Top foul, and this will come back out of play. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, John, when it started, but you know there were some years where a walk was credited as a base hit in the big leagues. I don't know exactly what year that was. They changed the rule, but there was a time when if you got a walk, it was a base hit. That's, thus came the old slogan, a walk is as good as a hit, because it was in those days. Well, uh, one thing is for sure, without question, and we don't even have to break out the stats for it, Tony Gwynn is a much nicer guy than was Ty Cobb. <laughs> but Tony Gwynn, one of the great gentlemen of the game, a great ambassador for the game. Two balls, two strikes. There's the Friar. It's off the fist. Gomez calls off Sinfraco, and that's the easiest inning for Ashby since the first inning of the game. Three up and three down. The Friar loves it. We'll return to Honolulu shortly. Sunday night baseball. And uh, the folks are having fun. And we told you a lot of folks would come out from San Diego, including Hank Bauer, formerly a running back with the San Diego Chargers, and now a broadcaster in San Diego. And uh, <laughs> that's going to be extra bases for Wally Joyner. A double Joyner with his third hit of the game. John, I, I used to know Hank. I don't know him anymore after looking at him in that outfit. I mean, I used to know the guy. We used to play dominoes together in the Charger clubhouse and stuff, but I, I don't think that's the same guy. <laughs> well, I think maybe it's his first trip to Honolulu, Joe. Oh, okay. And uh, he probably had some misconceptions about the way they dress out here. Oh, all maybe right. that's it. Okay. <laughs> and a host of Padre talk on the radio in uh, San Diego. A lot of people wanting to know, whatever became of Hank Bauer? <laughs> <laughs> And that's not the Hank Bauer used to play for the Yankees. Shallow center, Willie McGee. Clayton went out, McGee called him off, and uh, Greg Vaughn is 0 for 4. But that's the whole point. Come to a ball game, have fun. Although, then again, we need to qualify that. Yeah. <laughs> Hank, get a life, baby. <laughs> well, if they ever do get a major league team out here, Hank, I guess, is already putting in his bid to be the mascot. All right. <laughs> yeah, there's that word again, uh, Joe, as they say in Hawaii. Hank Bauer is pupule. <laughs> no question. Goes without saying. Yeah. Beautiful orchid, though, there, Hank. <laughs> yeah, pupule, crazy. So he wins the uh, he's the he's the mea puka for the uh, the dress up contest. It's winner Joe. Oh, okay. you knew, see you knew that I, phrase. I finally got mea that. Mea puka, one. yeah. Joe knew that phrase. Up the middle for Sin Franco, his first hit of the game. Joiner heading home. The throw cut off. Joiner scores. Eight to two for the Padres. Second RBI of the year for Sin Franco. Well, the one thing that the Padres are glad of, forget it, you know, the, the score, but they're hitting the ball. They're hitting line drives. They're hitting the ball hard. They have 12 base hits in this ball game. This is something that they've been in a slump collectively, all except for Tony Gwynn. He's the only one who's been swinging the bat well the entire season. And today, uh, they've all chipped in a little bit here. Here is John Flaherty now. Uh, you know, they're playing in a division that... The whole division has gotten off to a fast start. The Padres started the day four games out of first behind the Red Hot San Francisco Giants. The Giants today won their ninth in a row. They defeated the Florida Marlins. They swept the Marlins this weekend in San Francisco. 
Next ball to Flaherty for a called strike. One ball and one strike. In the West, everybody's gotten off to a good start. The Giants, an amazing start. Colorado defeated the Braves today, 11 and 5. That's only good enough to be two games out of this division. The Dodgers lost to the Astros today. They're 10 and 6, a great start. And they're three games out. You know, the interesting thing about that, John, is all the West Coast teams, they, they all started at home because of the weather, but they've all had a good road trip. The Giants just came off uh, of winning five or six in a row on the road. Five. Five in a row. The Dodgers had a good road trip. I mean, all those teams, Colorado, so they've all had good road trips as well as starting at home and being successful at home. So Colorado's been amazing on the road. Flaherty deep in the left center field. Way back there is Gant for the catch right at the 365 marker. And Franco will have to go back to first. And we're going to get a pinch hitter now for Ashby. So Ashby gave him seven strong innings in the heat of Honolulu. And he will retire now. Scott Livingstone comes out of the dugout and he will pinch hit. I presume. <laughs> Livingstone. for Ashby here in the seventh. A run is in, send Franco at first base. Eight to two for the Padres. Livingstone hitting 333, two for six. Two for three as a pinch hitter. That's a strike. He's another former Tiger. I got a lot of former Tigers in this club. Ashby, seven innings. Two runs, seven hits, six strikeouts, two walks, 93 pitches. You know, the Padres in San Diego and Southern, all through California in the early part of the season, it's been real cool weather. I, you know, you can't say cold when you see what it's been in Chicago and some other places, but very cool for out there. And then they went back east, and of course, it was just cold. The, the Cardinals, 10 days ago, got snowed out of the game in St. Louis. When we were there last week, temperatures got into the, the low 30s during our Sunday night telecast last Sunday. So this is quite a dramatic change after a couple of weeks of uh, real, real cool weather for these guys to come out here and to play in the 80s. Eight to two for the Padres. We're in the seventh. Bachelor, the third Cardinal pitcher of the game. And Mabry will take it. And that's the inning. Eight to two, San Diego. McGee coming up. Gant do third. We'll be back. The ESPN Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week is brought to you by the more than 1,525 AutoZone stores across America. AutoZone, the best parts in auto parts. The sounds of the sea surround me. One of my favorite tunes by the brothers Casimiro. A notable group here for many years in the Hawaiian Islands. There you go. And yeah, there's one we don't see often. Eat some poi now. I'm going to pass on the poi. Come on. No, I'll pass on it's the poi. It's time for a little luau here. Yeah, give us the shaka sign there in the Padre hat. Coming up Tuesday, hockey Stanley Cup playoffs at 8.30 Eastern. It will be Detroit and St. Louis game four of their series on ESPN. Then on ESPN2, Florida and the Rangers tied at a game apiece at 7.30. Anaheim and Phoenix on ESPN2 at 10.30. Game four of that series. The Blues, the Red Wings, the Panthers, the Rangers, the Mighty Ducks, and the Coyotes. All on ESPN and ESPN2. Well, Gomez just couldn't get that ball out of his glove, and Willie McGee beats the play. I don't think he was going to get Willie on that play anyway because he had to go deep to get it. And anytime you do that on AstroTurf with McGee running, he's going to beat it out. McGee's first hit of this game. Now watch this ball grounded right back up the middle. See, he's running at an angle. See, he's running away. I and mean, he can't throw Willie McGee out from that position. Now Danny Schaefer up in uh, Jordan's spot in the order. Tony La Russa having to juggle a little bit, trying to get the maximum out of his bullpen. After the doubleheader last night, he had to use Mark Petkaisic for six innings after Matt Morris, the starter, got hurt. Schaefer caught at third by Sinbrock. 
Marco for a double play, will he? That's Where are you going, man? You don't see McGee do that too often. I mean, the ball's right in front of him. It wasn't even hit that hard. Now watch, this ball is hit off the end of the bat. It's not hit like a shot. There's a lot of time in between. And I guess McGee either lost it or he just started. Now watch, he starts running right away, and then he realizes it's not hit that hard, but he can't get back in time. Well, it's the second time that a Cardinal runner has been picked off on a line drive like that. Two different line drives into double plays. Happened again back in the second inning. Here is Gant. Back in amongst the spectators, and a fan down there brought his glove, and he's got a souvenir. Nice catch. Sean Bergman ahead of Ron Gant as we play here in the eighth inning. Yeah, man, that's a big day. Big league baseball on the islands, and he got the foul ball. He said, Pays to bring your glove. Every once in a while, you get a chance. He'll be telling that story for years about how he caught the foul ball. When Major League Baseball came to Honolulu on Sunday Night Baseball. He'll be the guy. You mean you're the guy? Willie McGee has been that kind of a day for the Cardinals. So Bergman strikes out Gant. John Bergman makes short work of the Cardinals here in the eighth. Five pitches and out. Henderson coming up. This afternoon in Tiger Stadium, history made by Mark McGuire. A 491-foot home run is sixth of the year. Tigers bumped them 9-2, to two, but McGuire joins Frank Howard, Cecil Fielder, and Harmon Killebrew as the only players to hit it over the left field roof. John Joe. All right, and we are in Honolulu. Nobody has hit one over the roof here. But uh, the, in fact, the only home run in the three games have been played so far and inside the park homer today by Ron Gant. There is veteran left-handed Tony Fossis on the pitch for St. Louis here in the eighth inning. Cardinals also with a new left fielder, Steve Scarsoni, has gone in to play left, replacing Gant. There is Scarsoni. Scarsoni will hit in the eighth spot in the order and be due up third in the ninth inning. And uh, Fossis will be in Gant's number five spot. Here's Ricky Henderson. He's been on base every time. You know, Ricky is a guy, in show business, they call him a scene stealer. <laughs> you know, I mean, we know he's known as a base stealer and a great one, leadoff man. But I mean, Ricky attracts attention. I mean, he's got that, uh, that charisma because he makes things happen and he's done it today on Sunday Night Baseball. Sunday night baseball in the afternoon from Hawaii. And he's Frank to Ricky, and it's fun to see. I mean, after all these years, a great career, all the trade rumors and uh, trade talks, more than rumors. They all admitted that they were talking about trading Ricky. There has never been a question about Ricky's ability. The only thing people have questioned sometimes is his attitude and so forth, but they do that with a lot of players. And Ricky, this feels like, you know, he plays hard, he does his job, and that's what he's supposed to do. But, you know, some people have questioned, you know, his dedication to the game on occasion. I tell you what, I played with him that one year, and he impressed me. He could play. Henderson, three for three with a walk. Been on base four straight times, two stolen bases, two runs scored. Kilvio Veras is on deck. Three and two the count. Cardinals expecting to get Tom Pagnazzi, their catcher, and their center fielder, Ray Langford, back this week. And also Andy Bennis by the weekend, their ace starting pitcher. They still have uh, Rick Honeycutt on the disabled list. And they're not sure when he's going to get back. Top fly, shallow right center. The shield's going out. And it's caught by the right fielder coming in. That is Sweeney. Well, after more than 37,000 here last night, 40,050, the official paid crowd, and a two-day total out here. 
Very impressive, 77,432 paid admissions here at Aloha Stadium. See the empty seats in the outfield now. Score 8 to 2. Some folks have headed home for the barbecue. You know what's big here, Joe, is uh, families get together on weekends. I, I mean, uh, not every weekend, but you'll see people at parks and at beaches and whatnot having cookouts, having a big family day, and then they'll stay there the whole weekend. They'll camp. I mean, there's a limit, you know, to where you can go. You're on an island. <laughs> it's not like you can, you know, hey, let's drive, let's drive to Arizona for the weekend. You know, you, not that many places uh, you can go, but uh, a lot of folks like to get out for the weekend, have sort of a, a family luau, and, uh, and then they camp out, stay right there at the beach for the weekend, or wherever it is they go. Ferris into right center field, and that's McGee. Two men gone. Barris, two for five. Sports Center coming up right after the ball game. Stay tuned. Yeah, look at those guys. <laughs> and Aloha means Larry Beal. Larry Beal is from Hawaii. Now here is Tony Gwynn. Gwynn is only one for four, but he has a steal. Two runs batted in. Seems like he's done a lot, and he really, on a, a little ground out in the first inning, knocked in the first run and set up the second run for the Padres, who jumped ahead right away. So he has done a lot more than that one for four would tell you. Uh, right, too. That's something you don't see very often. You might see it in one pitch, but he, we've seen it two pitches in a row. He chases a breaking ball, and he's off balance. Now what, what Tony does, he strides the same place each time, and then he goes to the ball with his upper body. And he's been fooled by those first two pitches. That's Foster's career. Well, you're going to get in the tough left, he's out. That's why he's on the stand. First win has never done that well against the Cardinals, against all comers over the years. The only team against whom he has hit less than 300. And that deflection may have saved a hit. Fosses to Clayton and Gwynn is gone. One to six to three. Last chance for the Cardinals coming up. Sweeney, Mabry, and Scarsoni. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Aloha from Hawaii. Ninth inning coming up. Eight to two. The Padres are leading. Wednesday Night Baseball. Albert Bell, Frank Thomas, the White Sox. Cal Ripken, Rafael Palmero, and the Orioles. 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. The Orioles are hot. The White Sox are definitely not, although they won today. Then the second half of the doubleheader, it'll be Brian Jordan and these Cardinals again at Dodger Stadium, taking on Mike Piazza, Eric Karras, Raul Mondesi, Brett Butler, and the Dodgers. 10.30 Eastern. Big doubleheader on Wednesday Night Baseball right here on ESPN. And a lot of the see the, a lot of empty spots in the stands now a lot of the folks have began leaving Aloha Stadium we had a fan all of the commotion here a fan ran out onto the field to uh, create a, a scene here and uh, being escorted off the field well he took a ball out there for Ricky Henderson to sign and Ricky signed it and then uh, he took a dive at second base. Now he's on his way. To, he's on his. He's on his way. Give me one of those Hawaiian words for jail. Yeah. <laughs> Book him, Dano. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's where he's headed now. <laughs> yeah. Tom Selleck. Yeah. Five zero. Huh? Tackle him and off he goes. He's going to five zero. Here's Mark Sweeney against Sean Burton. 8 to 2 for the Padres, ninth inning. And that's low for ball one. Sean Bergman, by the way, could get a start on Tuesday when the Padres get back to the mainland if their ace right hander Joey Hamilton is not able to go. It'll be Overus. Can't handle it. He couldn't handle it twice. Sweeney is safe. Well, he got there in time, but. He couldn't make the play. I don't know how they're going to score it, but 
you got there in time to make the play. And on AstroTurf, you don't get bad hops on AstroTurf. Well, you see he's there, right there, in his glove, but it bounces away. And they're scoring it as a base hit, I guess. I don't see an error on the board. Yeah, it's a hit, all right, Joe. All right. Here's, <laughs> here's John Mabry, two for three. The run scored. Anyway, last night, Joey Hamilton was supposed to have pitched one of the games in the doubleheader for the Padres. Had to be scratched. His shoulder was uh, tight. And if he's not able to go on Tuesday, Sean Bergman would uh, most likely replace him. So this is Bergman's day to work anyway. So they're having him doing his uh, throwing right here in the game. In relief of Ashby, who was just excellent here. Although he, he had a couple of trouble spots in the fifth and sixth inning. Jonah, you know, you, the guy's results were very good, but maybe a team that's hitting a little better than the Cardinals right there might have done a little more damage in those... Uh, trouble spots for Ashby. Well, you're right, but he showed me one thing, John, is that he knows how to reach back and get a little extra when he needs it, and I think that's what got him out of trouble, you know, because he was struggling there in the fifth inning, and he reached back, got a little extra, and got out of trouble. Mabry, deep into left field, Vaughn is back for the catch. Hurrying back to first is Sweeney. There's not been a single home run in the three games here this weekend that have cleared the walls out there. Eight to two Padres in the ninth inning. And now Steve Scarsoni will come up next Sunday night. Joe and I will be in Miami. Joe Robbie Stadium. The Marlins under Jim Leland. He's also got a three outstanding young players there. Luis Castillo and Edgar Renteria, his double play combination, and Charles Johnson. The outstanding young catcher. That's hit deep into left field by Scarsoni, and Vaughn takes this one. And the Marlins will take on the Dodgers next Sunday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. And for our viewers out here in the Hawaiian Islands, that's 2 o'clock. Don't miss it. Joe and I will be in Miami physically, but we'll be here in Hawaii in spirit. Now David Bell, two down for the Cardinals. Well, the Cardinals, by sweeping that doubleheader last night, it's interesting, you know, they scored three runs and swept the doubleheader. And pitching coach Dave Duncan had to be proud of his staff to get so little and, and yet do so much with it. The last time a team swept the doubleheader and scored only three runs, 1981, the Cleveland Indians did it. And Cleveland's pitching coach then, Dave Duncan. So he's used to it. There are a lot of times you win a ball game by one run, but very rarely are there, you know, many one to nothing ball games. You know, you, you may win two to one or something like that, but one to nothing very rarely happens in the major leagues, especially nowadays. Down the right field line, foul. Now, Walter Johnson, I think, who came up in the dead ball era, has more one nothing games than any other pitcher. Sports Center coming up right after the ball game. Yes, the Cubs did win today in New York after 14 consecutive losses. Highlights of that. The NBA playoffs are all set to run now. And the NHL playoff recap. The Stanley Cup playoffs have already begun. We want those Cubs win. Cubs win. <laughs> That's Harry's line. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, Harry sounds better from you. Harry might not have been there today. No, he wasn't. He does the the, yeah. road, the home game. Okay. But he said it wherever he was. <laughs> I guarantee you, he was as happy as they were to win one. He toasted him yeah. and shouted Cubs win wherever he was. That's right. <laughs> Eight to two, two down in the ninth. Two and two to David Bell. Sweeney at first. This should do it. Sin Franco over to Varus. No. Yeah, it's an out. And Varus with a spectacular job to make sure that it got done on a bad throw by Sinfraco. The force on Sweeney ends the ball game. And the San Diego Padres Baseball in Paradise series has come to an end. The Padres winning one out of the three with the Cardinals and they're both head back to the mainland now. We'll see you next Sunday night from Miami. Mike Piazza and the Dodgers. Gary Sheffield and the Marlins. Eight Eastern, five Pacific and two here in the islands.
Sports Center is coming up next. Stay tuned for that. Final score here again, eight to two for the Padres. Ashby the winner over Rashio. Now John Miller for Joe Morgan. So long. Mahalo from Hawaii. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.